Dashing through the snow. We're dashing through the snow. 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 We're dashing through the snow. James. Yes. James. What? Is that the whole song? Yeah, no, that that's uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the that's dashing through the snow, the classic Christmas song. Okay. Yeah, oh. no, because like I, I, I mean, you just told me taught taught me this uh song a few minutes ago. Yeah. But I don't know it just seems a bit odd. Well, I mean, you know, it was part of the other pantheon of classic Christmas songs like uh, dashing through the snow, and um, dashing comma through the snow. Uh, dashing full stop brackets through the snow. Dashing over snow over thirty three six five. Ben, what's yeah. that on the table over there? Oh, it's a uh, it's a card. Oh my god, who who's left us a card at this time of year? So close to Christmas. Yeah, I know. We're the ones supposed to be sending cards. Yeah. Oh, I know. okay. I, I guess I'll rip it open. Uh, right. Okay. So, oh, look at this. It's, that's a cheeky little joke on the front, isn't it? What's it say? Uh, you just gonna have to laugh at it. Like I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, can't read it out. On... <laughs> it's not funny when you read it out. It's like one, you know, it's one of those. It's oh, a visual it, joke. oh, it's a visual joke. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah that's yeah. gonna play really well for the podcast. But Ben, what does it say yeah. inside the card? Okay, so it just says, uh, "Dear the boys, yeah. um, uh, I, I have a, a quest. No." I don't know what that says. I can't read that. So the handwriting quite bad. The quite bad. Uh, whoever wrote this probably doesn't do a lot of penmanship. Ben, do you want me to give it a quick read? I'm quite good at reading cursive. If you don't know. Okay, you you give it a shot. Okay. Dear the boys, I have come with you with a Christmassy request. For the other three hundred and sixty-four days of the year, I need to find a way to entertain myself at the North Pole. Could you come up with a video game that I could play to pass the time up until next Christmas? Your friend, St. Nicholas. Brackets, Santa Claus. Brackets, Père Noël. Hmm. Ben, do, do you know, uh, do you have any idea where that voiceover came from? Uh, no. No, no. Do the I. chimney. Oh, like, well, I, I know, didn't, I didn't even know watching. that we had a chimney in this. Uh, in yeah, this office. no. Okay, this office we're renting it. Um, mm, yeah. And well, it has I have a, a feeling that this card has a little bit of magic in it, and if that's the case, maybe the person who sent this is Santa, and it isn't just like an elaborate joke or whatever. Okay. So, by the sounds of things, Ben, this sounds like our most. Um, what's the good? What's the word that I'm thinking of? Big uh, jolly. Yeah, this is definitely the jolliest job we've ever gotten. Maybe mm -hmm. even if we need to save Christmas, uh, I guess. By no, no, this we're actually saving it every other day of the year. That isn't yeah, Christmas. actually, yeah. If anything, we're not saving for Christmas. One we're, man. Saving, we're saving Father Christmas, and we're not like saving yeah. him from like certain death, or whatever. Just from Borden, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is still quite, you know, important. Not as mm -hmm. important, but quite important. And no one ever buys him gifts, I assume. No, so if anything, we're doing the whole world a favour by doing this. Yeah. Wow, Ben. It's time to get ready for our most Christmassy episode of Game Over Time. <laughs> we're dashing through the snow. Dashing for oh hello everybody you caught us uh, in the middle of singing the theme tune oh hi I'm James and I'm dashing through the snow uh, Ben uh, what's the name of this podcast dashing <laughs> dashing through the snow welcome to Cast. the dashing to the snow podcast uh, every week yeah. we talk about dashing through the snow um now what is the actual name of this podcast oh my god you can only think of dashing through the snow can't you uh no it's game games we do games on this overtime. Game Snowva Time, because it's Ooh. a Christmas special. Dashing through the game Snowva Time. <laughs> yeah, dashing through the game Snowva Time. On a warm And night. we are making Christmas for Santa, but not Christmas. On mm, I don't know where I'm going with this one. We're making We're... Santa a game. Hey, the man who brings special gifts to every boy and girl across the world. We're bringing him a special gift this episode. Mm -hmm. 
which is a game that he can play for the 364 other days of the year that he's not delivering presents. Or 365 on a leap year. Or 300, yeah, 364 and a quarter, I guess, to be uh, okay, yeah. mathematically appropriate. Technically, it will be a leap year next year, just to make sure that I date this episode. But, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, well, it's going to be awkward when I accidentally release this in 2020, but, you know. I, I mean, if it comes out in 2021, I'll be surprised, but... Hey, that's it. Hey-o. Starting Hey-o. off, okay. starting off harsh, unfortunately. So, hey, I can't be harsh though, because I don't want to end up on the naughty list. Which I don't know if you know this about Sansa, but even though it's a massive security concern, he does keep a list of every child on Earth and whether they are good or bad. It's kind of a prick thing to do, in it. It's not right. I mean, I didn't like. I don't think it's GDPR compliant to begin with. No, I think it should be putting the parents on the naughty list, not the kids. Well, here's the question: When he says children, does he mean like people of a certain age? Because technically, everybody's a child of someone, mm-hmm. including like old people. They're children of like <laughs> older people, you know. And Christians, they're children of God. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, how, how does that list work? Like, is there a call after a while? Or, you know, what do they do? Uh, I think it's when you hit 16. <laughs> when, when you hit 16, you're no longer on the... I mean, that explains... No, a lot. Every, I... everyone gets put on the naughty list when they hit 16. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Well, good thing I'm still not 16 yet. Um, but, hey, let's figure this, some stuff out, though, because we're making a game for Santa, but the question is... Who or what is Santa? Uh, big jolly red man with white beard. Red man, like red man from uh, what's it called? The the not the Foo Fighters. What am I thinking of? The Wu Tang Clan. Eddie, but Eddie Redmayne. Yeah, Ben. Do you know what who the Wu Tang Clan are? Uh, vaguely. <laughs> I mean, I'm <laughs> surprised you even know them vaguely, Ben. That's, that's, that's a shock. That I is a Christmas movie. Them. I got, I got, I got some friends in there. Oh, you have friends in the Wu-Tang Clan, do you? Yeah. Oh, wow, I'm surprised. Well, we could have got them on. It's making a resurgence in this year. Oh, is, oh you, you reckon, well, right in the end of the tail end of 2019, yeah, the Wu-Tang, yeah. they're going to have a big comeback, you reckon? Yeah, they'll be in YouTube, re- YouTube Rewind 2020. Oh, wow. At least it's not PewDiePie. Oh, wait, no, he is in the Rewind 2019. Uh, hey, right. we're not talking about PewDiePie. We're not making a game for PewDiePie. No. That episode is probably going to come sometime next year. We're actually making a game for the Santa though. So you said he's big jolly man in a red coat, but mm-hmm. what else? He Do- well, he loves Christmas. I don't know if he loves Christmas. I think Christmas is his job. Okay. So would he would he be against a game about Christmas? See, this is what I was thinking, which is. If you're like, if your main job is doing Christmas stuff, the last thing you would want to do is play a game about you, like. Well, you know. it, it is a good point. You work an office job, night like nine till five every day, and on your day off, you don't want to play a game about working in the office. Well, no, exactly. If you work in an office job, who wants to play like? I mean, how many games can you think of off the top of your head which are like based in an office? I can think None. of like three games that have office set pieces. One of them yeah. being Fahrenheit by David Cage, where you get attacked by big bugs in an office. Okay. Or Control by uh, Remedy. Oh, oh yeah, Control by Remedy, which is set in a pretty big office. All right. Yeah. And then uh, Game Dev Story, which is in an office as well. I, I was thinking of that one, actually. Yeah. I was, that... I, actually, I was thinking of Game Dev Tycoon. Oh, yeah, sorry. Game Dev Tycoon is what I meant. Yeah, that is in an office. but So that's what I mean. Like... If you're Santa, I imagine, okay, some big no-nos then gameplay-wise. No crafting, because you're making presents no. like all year round mm, for kids. He doesn't do that though, does he? It's well, the elves. I, I imagine he has to oversee it. I know the elves yeah, are guess. the ones who make the presents, but he's still like, got a. He is the big boss. He's like project manager on it. He needs to make yeah. sure that, like, he has to have an understanding of what they're doing in order for them to work efficiently. So, I can imagine like okay. he wants to be involved in. So. Okay, so first thing's no crafting. Second thing's no management stuff. No, no, no. No, like football uh, not managers. Even like a, not even like Pikmin. You can't 
if he's got well, a that's what I was thinking because an RTS game like with Santa stuff with like elves but this is the thing that would be a good idea for anyone else but Santa yeah no Santa doesn't want to be doing that on his day no off. I don't it's think he does want 365 days off no so with strike so management games and RTSs you're out crafting okay. systems you're out survival games I'm only thinking this because of the fact that he lives right. in the North Pole, which I don't know whether you know this, but very cold, not a lot of wildlife there. Okay, but he's probably had to already like fight a polar bear. I imagine his, he fights polar. I imagine he fights polar bears quite like I. Yeah. I imagine his compound in the North Pole, whatever it's like. You remember like that tweet that the man was saying about he needed to have an AR-15 to fight off feral hogs. Yeah, yeah. I imagine Santa's like that, but with polar bears. 30 to 50 feral 30 to 50 polar bears just keep rushing me. Uh, uh, and my family. Yeah, the Santa compound and keep eating the elves. So that's why you always need to be strapped <laughs> with an AR-15. So, okay, there's a potential idea then. Santa, an FPS for Santa. What are we okay, thinking? Does, do you play as Santa in this? Or, okay, how about this? You play as Santa, but he's like really buff. Oh he yeah, like, like, a, Rambo. like an idealized Santa. So, yeah. he's, so he's cut, he's like... 30, 40 years younger. Maybe he, he like he says cool one liners all the time. You know what no, I'm thinking? No, you know what? You just put Santa's face on Dante. Call it a day. No, I was gonna say Duke Nukem, but you give Duke Nukem a Santa beard and a hat. Okay. <laughs> uh, which Duke can... Nukem though? What do you mean who's Duke Nukem? No, I said which Duke Nukem. Oh, Duke Nukem 3D. Ah, uh, okay, good. I I was worried you were gonna say forever then. No, Duke Nukem for... no. No, that, that would definitely, like, I'm sure he's got a naughty list, but then I imagine he's got, like, a really naughty list for, like, <laughs> you know, for crimson. Like you. Yeah. And that's how, that's what we're going to end up on if we make him, like, Duke yeah. Nukem forever. No, it's classic Duke Nukem 3D, so he doesn't say one-liners often, but when he... D <sighs> what are some... Okay, I, but, I'm like, to... I, I think... So, Santa, he's old, yeah? Um, I reckon well, before he... he got the job as Santa, like, he was young. And he probably enjoyed the likes of I don't know. He's probably like an NES NES kid, you so reckon? maybe we should make a game that takes him back to that period. This is what I was thinking because if he's quite old, I'm not being harsh on Santa or anything, I'm, and I'm not being harsh on old people because I mm. I feel like I'm quite harsh on old people in these episodes of the Game Over Time, <laughs> especially that one episode that we did with your poor grandfather where we were trying to make a game for him, but. Yeah, I think an NES style control because I think if we start throwing like twin stick shooters and gyro and fucking triggers yeah. and stuff like that, he's this, not gonna this know. This should be a game. This shouldn't even have sticks in it. He wants he wants a pad, a D pad. No, he, like a D pad or an arcade stick or a Wii mote. Like think of your right. mom. Like think yeah. of what would your mom like he's, be? I don't know. He's. I think he's more competent than my mom. I don't know. He's like. I don't know. Keep I, in mind. I assume he he deals with toys all day. I feel like he's got. You reckon he's he's got? Do you reckon he's got some understanding of how? Okay, how about this? Tablet game, no buttons. Okay. You that man will know how to use it. He probably builds thousands of smartphones every year to send to children for Christmas. So he probably mm -hmm. knows how they work. Yeah, I guess so. So okay, but uh, has he seen enough of them? I would have thought. I imagine he must use like an Android or something. No, but like, has 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 he not had enough of them? Maybe. Oh, you reckon? Hmm. Hmm. And you know like, what? Probably, I was about to say has that if Candy we crush on his phone, but like, I don't know. I was going to say if we made him a mobile invested. game. I know he said that he wants a game for three hundred and sixty-four days of the year, but if we made him a mobile game, he could be playing this between drop-offs on Christmas Day. You know. Yeah, but then we could like delay the whole thing. Yeah, I, Christmas could... Day could become Christmas two days. Oh no! Yeah, cr Christmas month. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, boys. There's been a delay on Christmas. But if you yeah, subscribe you'll be getting, to, you'll be getting your packages on uh, the eighth of January. But if you subscribe to Santa Prime, we can make sure that you get your <laughs> presents earlier than everyone else. Yeah, we don't want to do something that's distracting him from his job. It needs to be a no. home console. I think he can't. He can't take or it with PC. him. Or PC. Yeah. He seems like a PC or, dad. Yeah, he could, but then he could have it in his laptop. Unless the specs are really high. Um, you know he what? can't run it on his shitty laptop. I just said he's like a PC dad, and I'm thinking like PC dads, they like Euro Truck and stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of like a Euro Truck game, but it's like Santa's sleigh. Yeah. Like, Once uh, again, like, he does Well, that. again, again, I know that is what he does day in and day out. Again, I'm thinking 
uh, the problem is is that I'm thinking of ideas that are better for everybody else. Like I'm just yeah. like imagining, you know, it, it's got like the Euro Truck interface, but you've got like twelve reindeer in front of you, just like galloping in the air. <laughs> And he needs to make drop offs to like drop off presents and stuff, and it's just really hard to do. Right. Okay. We'll we'll figure this out. Okay. But... We'll put that on the maybe part. But yeah, but Sansa. What what Sansa? Yeah. Sansa FPS games. Uh, would you find right. him a bit too violent? Unless we could uh, find a way to tone him down. I mean, uh, yeah, he's kind of old. He's probably against that sort of thing. Well, this is the thing, though. This is talking about Sansa, this mythological mm-hmm. figure, right? Sansa. Yeah. He's not. He... He's not mythological. No, he is. He's a. He's been around for thousands of years, and I don't know whether you know. No, this. it's different ones. Oh, is. <laughs> oh, that's the theory you believe in, is it? Is yeah. the uh, the multiple Santa the... theory? <laughs> yeah. We got a Santa trooper on the podcast, everybody. Yeah, so uh, I've I've come to talk about some of my theories. Okay. Oh, Ben, how big is this PDF that you give me? Five thousand uh, pages. So this is hell? my um. This is my end of uni project that I submitted. I got kicked out. Ben, who's this person who's just walked into the room with a completely different accent? Uh, that's a Santa Trooper. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's Santa. <laughs> that's Santa Trooper dot org, is it? Yeah, they they sound like that. That's uh, the Bristolian, I see. Um, but yeah, no Santa mythological figure. Yeah? He can squeeze down chimneys so he can make himself like really thin. Squeeze himself, yeah. Okay, so he could and... have like a. You know, a, a Mr. a Mrs. Elastic. Well, this is the thing, but he also... He literally just lives on sugars and fats because all he does is eat cookies and drink milk. I, I think... He does that one day of the year. No, I wonder, though, whether that... Th- this is the theory I'm... Okay, so you got your Santa Truth stuff. Here's my Santa Truth and stuff. I think he's a big cat. <laughs> okay. Think about this, right? When he comes out of the chimney... A chimney, keep in mind, a chimney, famously full of soot and also full of, like, muck and snow and whatever that you bring off the roof. But when he walks across the carpet, it doesn't leave any marks. Because he's a cat. Right. He just moves on his paws. No problem, you know? Okay. So, let's think about this outside the box. Let's not be asking, what game would a Santa like? But what game would a cat like? That's I, Santa related. I'm gonna be honest. I don't want to go on this now. <laughs> ben, no. Just entertain this idea for a minute. No. Two at max. Yeah. And I won't. I I refuse. I'm sorry, James. I just can't do that. We'll put this in the maybe pal. But okay. I'm I'm gonna bring something up though. Two the things. Truth, the truth is out there. But yeah, what are you bringing up? Uh. So. I two things are this hmm. game has to it's got it's got to last him a long time. It needs to last for a whole year, three hundred and sixty four days. Yeah, well, possibly more because we're not going to make him a new game every year, are we? That's true. Uh, and the second thing is, I think it should have a tropical setting because he's never seen that. He's never seen what? A tropical setting. Okay. A daytime tropical setting. He's seen he's seen nighttime tropical areas. He 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 goes over different places overnight, and you know he sees them. But yeah, no, he's he he's. He'd I like don't know Hawaii. whether you know this, but Duke Nukem 3D. One of the level packs is him on holiday. Right. Okay. It's him on holiday with um, like uh, like on a beach setting. And it's tropical, and they've replaced like some of the weapons with tropical ones, and like the card keys and stuff. They're all tropical. Okay. So we're already on the idea of making him more like uh, Duke Nukem, anyways. Just lean into that. So I'm I'm getting a bit thirsty actually, and um I know it's I know it's um a bit early to be doing this, but it is Christmas. Mm-hmm. Yes. And we're you know got to have a break early. Uh, That's true. And we did say a, that a hot chocolate break. Yeah, we did say that we promised ourselves because it is our last day of operations before Christmas. We would give ourselves another half hour to enjoy. So yes, we we'll have a seasonal hot chocolate break. Hi everybody, welcome to the 
Hot Chocolate Break, part of game Snowva Time. That's right, even our break has a Christmas special. Ben, how's it going? I am going. Good. Bye. Oh, there he goes. I guess while well, Ben's... Oh, no, we don't mind. Uh, okay. It's hey, the time ben. of Christmas and time of giving. So why don't we give our plugs? Yes, I was about to do that. Uh, okay, here we go. Right, so I think the first thing I should do is get the uh, important stuff out of the way. Which uh, is? So I would like to thank Maxo for the music of the podcast. It's very good. And thank you, Maxo, for camp. both the theme tune and the tune to Coffee Break. And I would like to thank our patrons. Uh, one of them is James. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, Rebecca. And thank you, Lamhoot. Oh, yeah, I recognize that was... name. Yeah, thank you, Lamhoot. I wonder if he'll be on the podcast at some point. Oh, I hope so. We could have got him on to play Santa. Uh, yeah. Oh, well. Shame that we only save our guests to um special, uh, what's it called? Uh, you know, every five episodes or so. Yeah, and that's only going to happen next time, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, let's see what happens with that, I suppose. Yeah, okay. And uh, is there anything else I need to do? Do you want to plug your stuff? Yeah, I could plug my stuff. Uh, I do hey. Twitter and YouTube. Hate me then on both of them, and I might upload a video in the next year. Um, yeah. And what are you? Hi! I used to be Games D on YouTube, but now I'm Hot Cider on YouTube, which is exactly the same as my Twitter name as well. H O T C Y D E R. Uh, no new videos. I just realized my... something. Uh, do, What's do all the links on our fucking episodes work? <laughs> Probably hmm. not anymore. No, I will quick... need to send you a new YouTube link. I'll I'll try it. Let me just YouTube. And it does work. Okay, never mind. No okay, problem. never mind then. All right. No, no need to update. But uh, yeah, so uh, Games uh, Games D, goodbye. Hello, Hot yeah. Cider. Uh, and hopefully uh, should some new videos soon that will reflect that. But other than that, hey, I do this podcast. So that's pretty good. This is all I do. <laughs> For now. No. Well, you never know. You might, you might have something coming up. Yeah, maybe. Right. Maybe. We'll see. Hey though, Ben. Yeah. It's the it's we're coming to the end of twenty nineteen. And not mm -hmm. only does that mean the end of a year, but also an end of a decade, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And usually on most gaming podcasts, they would do say, you know, at the end of the year and the end of the decade, they might do a special kind of list to, you know, maybe rank the stuff that they enjoy playing most over the year and over the decade. Okay. But a game overtime, we don't just want to do what other game podcasts do. We want to put our own special twists on stuff. And as this is a special Christmas episode of Game Overtime, it is. I think what probably would be a good idea is if we, while I stall for time to so remember mm -hmm. what I wrote, is maybe if we did a Christmas themed game of the year list where. We don't just say all the stuff that we like because we unfortunately we would be here forever. But we did a ranked like list of games that you would give as particular gifts at this time of year. Yeah. So right. let's start with the first category of this. Okay. Which is a BMX. Now, Ben, you're a child. I assume you have parents. Yes. Correct. I do. I imagine that your Christmases, there was probably that one big present that you would wanted more than anything. Maybe I it might have been a... What's that? It was a scooter. It was a scooter. See, there we go. It was a scooter. Some people, it might be a PlayStation. Some people, it might be a crisscross crash uh, Hot Wheels set. But... Mm -hmm. Kind of the encompassing of the ideal platonic big Christmas present has always been the BMX, the off-road bicycle. And this category represents that in the style of these games that are, as you say, triple A, as in, you know, 
They're made on a budget of maybe $3 million or more. They had maybe over 100 people working on it. And yeah. they'll retail anywhere from 40 quid upwards. Usually PC games, usually console games. Handheld and mobile stuff never really kind of falls under this. So this is... These are like the IGN awards. These are the the, the biggest games going. And so it makes sense that these are the, the awards that we give first. So Ben, yeah. what is your... BMX of 2019. Well, James, and this is going to surprise you. It's not. It's Sekiro. Um, okay. Yeah. Now we did talk about Sekiro. Sekiro. Yeah. Sekiro. We did talk about. We did talk about Sekiro on yeah. this podcast not so long ago. In fact, I think it might have even been on the return episode that we did. However, we are going to say a little bit about why we did pick these games and what, maybe why they are our platonic. Christmas presents like BMXs or whatever. So Ben, mm -hmm. Sekiro, why is it yes. your BM of BM twenty nineteen? Uh, I think it's really good. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I like from software. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a shill. I've seen your Dark Souls tattoo. Yes, I, yeah. I you know. Uh, I, I do like their games. I like Dark mm. Souls three the most of the Dark Souls. I have not mm -hmm. played Bloodborne, and I want to play Bloodborne, but I do not have a PS four, mm -hmm. and I um. I, I, I really like Sekiro, and I think it's yes. the best game. I think the combat is very cool and fun, and very rewarding, and uh, very exciting. I like a good combat system. Uh, yeah. I think the world is cool, and looks good. I like the level design more than I like it in most Souls games. I think Would if I have one complaint... It... Oh, go okay. On. I was going to say, do you feel like it earns its AAA status? Yes. Uh, there's a big fight with a dragon, and it's very cool looking, and it's it's got great music. You jump up into the sky and shoot lightning at it, and that fight just makes me think, "Wow, triple A." Is is it like my famous saying of, "Wow, this feels like the most expensive game ever made"? No, I I want cool Sekiro. What like I don't know. I don't get that that vibe. You don't get it. that. You feel like the money is being used correctly on it. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't like. It doesn't flaunt itself. It looks very good. Uh, mm -hmm. Like there's no part of that game is unpolished for sure, starters, and it's just you know it just it works it it, it all works. It, it feels good. like it, it feels like great. the platonic AAA game where they were given the money and the time that they needed to make a nicely polished product, and they did. Yeah, and nice. it's, it's quaint length of like forty hours ish. Um, it's all good fun. I love it. Have you replayed it since it came out in March? Uh, I mean, I I played it five times in March. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess by since... by the power of math, I guess <laughs> you may have played it recently. Um, I don't I, know. I played it last month. I actually streamed it. Uh, okay. I was playing the first person mod that someone had created. How did you find it? Uh, it was very interesting. I liked it though. It was good fun. Okay. Uh, it's it's very heart pounding when you have the enemies right in front of you. And, like, I can imagine. Swinging their swords right at you. It's spooky. I can, yeah. I imagine that it does really put you in it. It's oh, cool. and I um, I use my Switch Pro controller because uh, mm -hmm. I didn't want to use PC controls because I don't like them. No. And I also didn't want to use the stick to control the camera because I thought it was boring. So I hooked up my Switch Pro controller. And you use gyro. Working, and I use gyro. And, and it you feels find very it? good. It, oh, it nice. feels great, yeah. Oh, good. I so... think if you're going to play Sekiro in first person, that's the way you should do it. Hmm. Would you suggest people play Sekiro first person their first time through it? No, I no, very much I didn't wouldn't. think so either. Uh, it made the game a lot harder. I yeah. I'm very good at Sekiro, not to toot my own horn, but I can get through that game pretty okay. Uh, I did I did not do very well. I did okay. No, I'm doing all right, but like, yeah, it's it's definitely harder. Okay, but okay, that's a pretty good BMX. Uh, ben. What do you think my BMX is of uh, uh, Well, I've got a few things in mind. I'll, I'll okay. throw them out. I'm going to say uh, Control, Luigi's Mansion 3, Resident Evil 2. I think, actually, I'd say that so those three. Do you know what's funny? What? Because I, I wrote these. So I was stuck on what free game, um, those three games for what I wanted to be my, okay. um, my BMX of 2019. But here's the thing. I, I, I haven't I haven't cheated out. I have picked one game out of them, and this is going to be my argument for why it is my BMX of the year. And the game is 
controlled by Remedy Games. Okay. Because all three of those games are very similar, as in... They are. They are open-world-style games, but with linear progression, for, like a mm -hmm. linear structure and a linear progression through it. They're I both the kind least of broke linear up. of the three is Resident Evil. Because when you're at least in that first section, when you're in the mansion, there's a lot of. Yeah, when you're in the police station, there's a lot more puzzle. It's more oh, like yeah, solving a puzzle cool. box, yeah. and then once you into the sewers, and then pretty much it gets linear from there. And then Luigi's Mansion kind of is more linear from there, but it still kind of has that puzzle aspect of you're not always going to the same place. But then you get to control where it is a cent. Essentially, it's got the same structure as Metroid Prime. Uh, not Metroid. <laughs> no, it has not got the same structure as Metroid Prime. It's got the same structure as Metroid Fusion, which is kind of why I like it. Where it essentially, it is this kind of open world, but you're going through it. Like, you kind of know where you're going every time, and you can go off the beaten track and find other stuff. But here's the thing about it. And also, they've all kind of got the same sort of rhythm of sometimes you're solving puzzles, sometimes you're exploring something, and then sometimes you're doing a like a combat encounter. Even Luigi's Mansion kind of has that, even though it's not like a third-person shooter. But where it's Control... It's a third-person sucker, though. Yeah, it's a third-person vacuum game. But the reason I went with Control is because of its originality. And I know it's kind of a bit cheeky to say because of the fact that Luigi's Mansion 3, Resident Evil 2 Remake... Like, they are based on games that have come before and kind of mechanics that have already been baked in place. And in fairness, Control is a third-person shooter. But there's something about its aesthetic and something about the way that it plays and the way that it looks that I feel like it kind of brings it up over those two games. And again, it's funny because, like, Luigi's Mansion, that's a fantasy game that looks like a Pixar or like kind of a DreamWorks movie with that kind of animation aesthetic. And obviously Resident Evil 2, even though it is kind of based in the real world, there is kind of that weird element to it of it's a police station, but it's like an old mansion and it's full of like zombies and big monsters and stuff. But mm. I just find Control's world way more interesting. And in that interesting aspect of it, it's super cohesive, which is yeah. weird. Like it's really well thought out and it's kind of well thought out in the way of you want to get into it and you want to find out more about it and the game does a lot of stuff to kind of give you stuff to like look into it there's lot like on the kind of the light level there is they just have documentation all over the place where they redact enough into it where there's it tells you enough but there's enough mystery in it that kind of gets your brain going and going I've, oh I've this said is it before, cool but yeah I'll, I'll say it again it's possibly my favorite game to read things in. Uh, Same. I I they, I think it's consistently interesting and consistently enjoyable. Like they make it uh, funny or fun to read. Just it's quirky. About. Yeah. And again, like I know, I like with my originality argument for this game, it's a lot of this stuff they were kind of riffing on in Alan Wake, which came out on the Xbox 360 like a long while back, where. They're kind of dipping their toes into this sort of... It's a kind of a mundane situation, but it has this abstract weirdness to it that they treat like it's mundane. But Control, like, knocks like knocks it on the head in regards to kind of how that looks and how that sounds and how that feels. Uh, it's the only game I've played where, mi where it mixes in live-action elements and it actually looks really good. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, all no, the it, it's seamless. Yeah, all the stuff with the um, like the old director and like Polaris and stuff when they overlay that while you're playing it is fantastic. How it looks is genuinely excellent, and like one on a graphics level of the fact that they went for that particular blocky, like brutalist architecture and aesthetic to drive the fact that they could do destruction on everything and have everything look really nice. That's a good, like, that's all fantastic, but just how that world looks, like, it's stuck in the 1950s, like, you know when they built this place and what bits are new and what bits are old. It's really neat, and I like the writing in it. The Again, if I had to throw a complaint at that game, the last half an hour of that game does, un, does start to undo a lot of goodwill, because essentially you're not 
interact with any of that interesting stuff. You're kind of in a void where you're just fighting waves of enemies, which is boring. Mm. But I don't know. All the early stuff is good. And if as a platonic AAA game, I would say that of the other choices, like if you want to, if you want to show somebody, hey, this is what games are like right now. I was showing them because again, it's got like bits of other, you know, it's got the thing that other games have of, oh, this bit's a bit like Dark Souls, oh, this bit's a bit like uh, Destiny, this bit's a bit like this, but yeah, it marries them all together in a way that I find cohesive and like not at all that it feels like it's a sum of its parts. It feels like it is a nice whole. It looks really good. It plays well on my nearly eight-year-old PC at six frames per second, which is surprising. And it looks very good with ray tracing. But yeah, I have seen bits of it with ray tracing. It looks very good. I Yeah, I, it's not the most unique game that I've played this year, but it's certainly the most dare... Uh, it's not, maybe not daring is the word, but this, the most confident game that I've played yeah. this year. And this is like... Even RE2, which is like an incredibly confident game, I still think that Control edges it out just by doing weirder things and pulling it off so yeah that's why control control didn't blow my mind but i don't i definitely enjoyed it yeah i would say if if not to not to do a not to not to pour piss on any of these 2019 games that were going over because they're all very solid games nothing this year has blown me away but like i think it's very i think considering the fact that games are kind of evolving on a more iterative basis like you don't get one big game that blo like you don't get an ocarina of time anymore which pushes so many different aspects mm. forward you just get games that kind of they move the bar up bit by bit with each release so nothing ever feels like like i think like the last game that people would say that was like was maybe breath of the wild but even then if you look at it like Breath of the like there's lots of elements in that where oh that's a bit like MGS five or that's a bit like Dark Souls, yeah. that's a bit I, like I fuck. Think, I personally don't think there's like so much in Breath of the Wild that it's like oh wow, this is just completely next level. Nah. I mean but And I think as well because I, I, I think that's the one thing with fun. Nintendo games is that you're always comparing them to what came before. So something like Breath of the Wild, which throws out so much of like Ocarina of Time and and like Link to the Past and stuff, it does feel more like a pardon the pun, breath of fresh air. But again, I but again, I really like Control. Control is a very solid game, and of the quote unquote AAA games that I played this year, it was the one that had me the most interested, which. I feel like a lot of arguments they can throw against AAA games is that they are quote unquote safe, and I would say that this told the line nicely. It was confident, but it was happy to go off the rails. Uh, so. Quick question: Are we doing honorable mentions now? Do you want to do AAA honorable mentions? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I don't think this game is AAA. I'd probably say it's double A. I don't. I don't. Yeah, it's um. A game that I just don't think I'd talk about much, and it's a game that unfortunately went under the radar uh, for most people, I think, and it's AI The Somnium Files, mm. which is okay. a visual... No it's a visual novel. Uh, it It's it's a visual novel that looks like an adventure game sometimes. Uh, there are sections of it where you can actually walk about, but those are few and far between and it's essentially a mystery game uh it's by the guys who did the uh, by the guy who did the zero escape trilogy and it's i there's not much to say about it without spoiling stuff it's got mm. some cliches in it that i'm not super into and there are some really weird action set pieces but if you can take them with a grain of salt which i learned to do mm. uh it has an extremely compelling narrative uh yeah. possibly my favorite story in anything ever mm -hmm. uh maybe bar okay the 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 one game i compare its story to in that i think it's extremely good cohesive amazing characters and like just so it ends perfectly just the way you think it should is ghost trick yeah the ghost trick was what was in my head when you started saying that stuff yeah 
And that is the only game I'd actually say compare his story to him. In B. Okay, yeah. that's high praise. That is that is very high praise for me. I I really okay. like the game. It's still quite expensive. Uh, hmm. uh but and you know it it looks good. It it's yeah. Uh, but like, there's not much to say about it without spoiling anything. So I'll just be like, yeah, I like it. Okay. Uh, my honorable mentions uh, were the two that I mentioned, which were Resident Evil 2 and Luigi's Mansion 3. I'd also say those two, yeah. Uh, both very good games. Uh, I won't go over them too much, but essentially Resident Evil 2 is like a nice marriage between the look and exploration stuff of RE7 with more of the mechanics of RE4. Luigi's Mansion 3 is the best Luigi's Mansion game, which is not... It's not it's a highest very, part, but it's yeah. I I would say I you know, but I would say the Luigi's Mansion game have always been excellent. But I would say that this is the best of them. Uh, yeah. And two other games that I'll mention: Super Mario Maker Two. Not that I really need to say much about it because we had a entire episode about it. Uh, Link's Awakening to an extent. Uh, I really enjoyed playing it, but there's nothing exceptional about it. The most exceptional thing I liked about it was the uh, control scheme. Which was always had like even though a jump button isn't like always on because it's an item, I would be happy for Zelda games from now on to just have a jump button in them because it just blows the whole thing up. I like it a lot in I think that. We will. Yeah, uh, the dungeon builder I also really like, but that was kind of more a personal thing for me. I know a lot of people didn't get a lot out of it because it is very simple. I like the puzzle aspect of it. Uh, one last actual game, honorable mention wise, uh, Apex Legends. Which I would yeah. I would say counts as a triple A on oh, as a BMX game. Yeah. Yeah. Um the only reason I wouldn't push it any higher is that uh, I played that game a lot when it came out and haven't really returned to it, unfortunately. Yeah, um but I feel I, but I feel I yeah. should at some point. Mm. But uh, um, I a very good like... game from Respawn. hmm They made two games this year, wow. They released two games. And one on uh Jedi Fallen is also pretty good. Okay, uh, would you give it an honourable mention yet, or have you? Nah, do you need to get into it a bit more still? Yeah. I'd, okay. Uh, but no, my other honourable mention was going to be uh, Smash Ultimate, which did not come out this year. Hmm. But uh, four of the DLCs, uh, uh, well, maybe five, we'll see. Four of the DLCs have been released for it. Actually, no, five have, because Piranha Plant. Got to buy them. Okay. Uh, five DLCs have been released for it this year. I have played it more this year than I have last. Uh, yeah. And... Yeah, no, I love it, and it's I I go to tournaments for it, and I think it's a very cool game. And I don't know whether you know this, although you probably do. I'm saying this more to the people at home. It is now the best-selling fighting game of all time. It has beaten off Street Fighter 2. And the best-selling Switch game of all time. Is it the best-selling Switch game as well? Yes. Wow. Because I yeah, saw that thing the did, other day did where it numbers. was... Yeah, no, it did very big numbers. Wow. It beat off Mario Kart. That's amazing. Anyways... Yeah. So those are our BMXs. Now we go to the opposite end, which is our stocking stuffers. Now, a BMX, obviously, is a big expensive present, but sometimes you want to give some something small to somebody, or you want to maybe give a lot of small things that you can stuff in a stocking. And so as this name suggests, these are games that are small. They're not like, you know, not a full meal. They're more of an appetizer, but they're by no means lesser experiences. They are still... Incredibly solid titles, but they know when to, they know when to show up, do their thing, and then head off. Uh, and again, like like we said with the AAA, our kind of specifications for this is stuff which didn't probably maybe cost a million or less to produce, maybe only had a team of less than a hundred people work on it, maybe more like teams of ten or twenty indie games essentially. And with this. Like mobile is mobile and tablet and portable stuff definitely falls under this bracket. Uh, by the way, people at home, uh, if it turns out the control or Sekiro were made for less than three million, and any of the games that we mentioned were made for more than one million, uh, please don't Oops. let us know. We're not going to double check. <laughs> ben, what is your stocking stuffer for twenty nineteen? Okay, I've I've got a few things. Uh. A lot of cheating is going to be done here. Oh, is this the one that came with caveats? <laughs> yes. Okay, so, Ben, you want... James, James okay. is, like, pushing me. He's saying, Ben, you got to come up with something. Ben, Ben, Ben. And he keeps saying Ben over and over. And I'm I'm struggling because I've not played a lot of indie games that came out this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I played a lot of indie games this year, just not many of them came out. Uh, and 
well, okay. So first off, I go with my basic pick, which would have been Gato Roboto. Okay. Uh, a game I really enjoy. is very short. Uh, way too short. Essentially, uh, you're doing your honorable mentions now. Yeah. Is, okay. So and Gato if, Roboto. If, if we're not talking technicalities, I guess it would probably be my stocking stuffer. Uh, okay. But I'm going to try and sneak under the radar with my actual one. Uh, my other one uh, that I actually only just remembered is Noita. And I don't know if I played enough of it. Um, oh it's yeah, the, still um, early access. The, the, the... Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. It's a roguelike. Uh, it's basically just simulates every pixel, and it's pretty cool. Yeah, and I've, it's I cool. really enjoyed playing it, and I I'm kind of waiting to revisit it when it's got like a lot more updates. Uh, so I'm I'm tentatively saying yes. I think it would probably deserve to be here, but it's still an early access, so I'll leave it for now. Okay. And <laughs> okay, so my I I sent the message to James just saying my I I've got one. But it's neither an indie game, nor, nor is it. Was nor did it come year. out this year. Tell me the name of the game first, and then make the argument for why. Right. Okay. Well, actually, no. I'm not gonna tell the name of the game first. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna make my. Are argument. we gonna do it like stars in your eyes? Are you gonna give me like details, and I need to figure out what the game yeah, is? You'll know. You'll know what it is after I say like one thing. Um. Okay. So you know how you get a small team, and they do a thing, and they release a game. That was not previously available. Kinda. Okay, it's a fan translation. Uh, <laughs> this is. Oh, hold this on. Is, yeah, this is very hold cheap. The I know. Hold the phone here, Ben. <laughs> now this this would probably this should have been your triple A pick. All right, no, but keep going. All right, yeah, this is illegal. Now a, f- a small team, a very small team, have decided to translate a video game <laughs> called uh, the Great Ace Attorney. Mm. Mm. Keep in uh, mind, this small team that translated it didn't make the game, which no. I feel is that that was the specifications for but this. But they edited was... it, <laughs> and they it did not come out this year, but the translation did. Okay. Uh, and the team, I mean, all, it's a visual novel, so like they had to write it. Okay. Oh no, no, that's fine. No, and obviously yeah. they had to work around the timing and all that yeah, sort of they, stuff. They're they... essentially taking a game that already exists, and they have to. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just I'm, imagine. I'm just imagining though, is that you're putting like some something in somebody's stocking, and then they wake up and they pull it out, and it's just like an an ISP an IPS file, and you're like, <laughs> right, you already need to own this game, and it's forty quid on 3DS, so and you're gonna have to import uh, it as well. Four, so. It's, it's 40,000 40, yen, or four thousand <laughs> yen, on 3DS. Good luck. Okay. Uh, so yeah, no, uh, this is cheating, but the great is turning. Um, a game that was not available outside of japan mm-hmm. a game that's still not available outside of Jam- japan officially uh translated okay. by a team called the scarlet study and they're working on the sequel at the moment okay. and the game is cool i like it uh it's it's very much a part one is what it feels like okay you play through it and there's about 50 loose ends but knowing that the sequel that there is a sequel and that it addresses it is easier to it it makes it easier with me Okay. And it's I just like Ace Attorney. Okay. That's it. How do you feel this game sums up being a stocking stuffer for you? Um it's not very long. Okay. Uh, it doesn't feel like the most expensive game ever made. Do I have to play this on my PC? Could I play this on an, like an emulator on I, a phone or something? Uh yes, there is a mobile version of it. Okay. Uh I mean it's still a lot of stuff to get get it working, but because it's, sure. it's Japanese. I played right. it on my 3DS. Okay. So I've I've done uh sinful things to my 3DS, which I will not talk about here, because okay, I might yeah. get arrested. M- Mimoto is in the corner of the room, keeping yeah. like looking looking at you through his newspaper. But and, all right. Yeah, but no, I'm I'm I just kind of want to mention it, and if I had to pick one, I just like I guess I go with Noita because I like that, and okay. also Gato Roboto. Yeah. Okay. We will give... Okay, you know like in Super Mario, like in the 3D Super Mario games when you've already collected a star and it's like a clear star? Yeah. Okay, we're going to give one of those to the great Ace Attorney and then we'll have to technically give the gold star to no- Noita, even yeah. though that, didn't, that wasn't really it. Um, okay, you know what though? I respect I respect that. I can I can see the thought behind it, which is... It does have an indie spirit behind the title, but the indie spirit is in bringing this... G- it's like uh, the people who translated Mother 3, you know? 
It's a group of small, a small dedicated fan base who wanted this game to come over to the US, translated into English, and they put in the work to make it happen, much mm-hmm. like a, a small indie team would put in the work to make a full-size game happen, like yeah. a Shovel Knight or something to that. Or a Hollow Knight or a Knight Knight. Um, Fight Knight. Oh, Although yeah, I don't I know what's happening game. with Fight Knight. Uh, I it's think coming that's... out this next year. I've, I have I backed it on Kickstarter. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Quite looking uh, forward to it. Ben, what do you think my uh, what my uh, stocking my stuffing st- my stuffing my stocking stuffer is? I'm trying to think. Uh, I know it's going to be obvious when you say it. I feel mm-hmm. because when I when I thought about your top three thingies, I was I was pretty certain about them. I'm actually mm-hmm. pretty proud I got all three of them. No, I know uh, it's, it, that is weird. I probably would have pinned you as an RE2 though. Uh... Ari Two was close. Yeah, I will say Ari Two was close, but Control it just had a bit more interesting juice to it. Did Into but... the Breach come out this year? No, no Into the Breach it... came out last year, but that uh... would have that would have been my stocking stuffer in uh, twenty eighteen. Oh god, I'm trying to think. Um, what came out this year? <laughs> Let me just do a quick Google. You can, you can delay. You can maybe set it up. Uh. Should I do a stars in your eyes thing where I can start to yeah. describe around the game? Yeah, because right. I can't think of anything that came out this year. So this play. game is by a developer whose stuff I didn't really... I really respect the stuff that he makes, but nothing that he made previously really clicked with me, which is weird because I know people who one of his games really clicked with somebody that I know and like to the point that that is like their go-to game for everything. But then he came out with a game this year, which... On paper, I felt like I was going to love it because I have a weird relationship with this game where on the one hand, it's like it, it's I love it because it's kind of like this is the game that I've always wanted. But I also hate it because I wish this is a game that I had made. It kind uh, of has like all the hallmarks of stuff that I like. And Ben, you will appreciate this. This game has a lot of stuff in it, which is... Very similar to a game that I have made that you have played a few times previously. Right. Um, but this game is a PC game. I it's think it's Baba also is you. Available... Sorry? It's not Baba is you. No. Baba Baba's gonna be a honorable mention. Yeah. This is a PC game. It's also on ta- I think there's a tablet and mobile version. There isn't a console version yet. It is what you would describe as a roguelike, which is weird because I don't like roguelikes that much, but I find this one really entertaining because it's less of a... Because the problem with roguelikes is that they try and take an RPG structure and they just kind of add the permadeath and hardness to it. Where this goes in the opposite direction, where it's more like an arcade game. Oh, which I, I do, it is. Which I do like. It's like Tetris or it's like uh, Geometry Wars. Uh, ben, do you want to see what it is? It's Dicey Dungeons. Dicey Dungeons by Terry Kavanagh. Uh, I love this game. So what's he done Quite. before? Uh, Super Hexagon. Oh, okay. Super Hexagon and uh, VVVVV. Ah, I like VVVV. Yeah, that's why I mean. he makes games that really click with people. And I do like, I like Super Hexagon, but I don't love it. I absolutely adore Dicey Dungeons, though, because it is again, it is the game that I wish that I had made from the way that the mechanics work, to the way that it looks, to the way that it sounds, it is perfect in regards to it's a wow. like it's a game show version of a roguelike of a like of a D and D game where playing with the dice isn't just like you don't just roll to make like oh you add like a number onto the rolling dice does shit like you add numbers to stuff to make weird things happen. Dice need to be like evens or odds for certain things to happen. You need to have numbers over this and numbers under that. It's really playful with like dice stuff, which is like what I'm really into. Um, every character doesn't has their own unique thing, which like your regular fighter character essentially you just add numbers onto stuff, but then you have 
like a thief character who steals the abilities of the enemies that you're fighting, but also you can split your dice into smaller numbers so you can do more attacks, but they're weaker. You have a robot who doesn't have a dice, doesn't generate his own numbers. You have to keep pressing like a power button. And sometimes you look out and you get big numbers. And then sometimes the number gets too big and he breaks. So you can't make any attacks <laughs> around. Uh, there's a witch who every number on the dice corresponds to a different spell. So you need to figure out okay, I might not be able to get these numbers, but I can get these numbers so I can do this. Um, it looks really good. It's kind of got like a sort of a, like a kind of a flat cartoonish style, but it's not like overly kind of cartoony looking. It's kind of more vectory. The soundtrack is like, it's like a fantasy game show. And it is, gen it is by the person who does all the Terry Kavanaugh's soundtracks and they knock it out of the park with this one as well. Um, why is it my platonic ID for a stuff and stocky game? Because I would give this game to everyone if I could. It's like 15 quid. If I had like 100 quid to spare, I would send everybody a copy of this game for Christmas just so they can play it. I genuinely think that, like this is one of those games that kind of like, oh, you know, shooters aren't for everybody. Visual novels aren't for everybody. But this, I would happily give them a copy. Of, I feel like anybody could get into this. And, you know, not everybody's going to love it, but everybody could pick this up and get it, yeah. I think. Um, yeah, I like, I like, like Control is a very good AAA game, but, like, I would say Dicey Dungeons is my favorite game of this year. Easy. Fair enough. Uh, ben, have you got any questions about it? I, <laughs> there's not, I don't know enough about it, to be honest. It sounds fun, though. I I and think you would like it. I, I don't like it too. I don't think you would get as much out. Like I said, I I get a lot out of it because on the one hand, I find it really fun. I it's it's got a little bit of that into the breach stuff to it of like it's all turn based, but you can be weird with your tactical stuff. But again, it is very similar to the game that I have made in uh, on on cards and dice. It does strike except... me as a games D product. It does strike you as a, as a, a games cider, default slash a hot, hot cider, cider project. Um, yeah, I don't know. If we get big Patreon money from this episode, I'll gift yourself a copy of it. Okay. What I'll say. Um, honorable mentions, though, for our stocking stuffers. Uh, Ape Out, which I think came out last year. No, it came out this year. I'm, okay, it did come out this yeah. year. Yeah, Ape Out, I really like. There isn't a lot to it, but I think that's... It is yeah. It is the perfect ideal of get in and get out. Like, yeah, as uh, I mean, the sound design is excellent. Everyone said it. Um, yeah, exactly. There's, yeah, the, Jacob's made a fantastic video about it. Everyone's said really good things about it. It is it is wonderful. Yeah. Um, Baba is You. Is amazing. Baba is You is really clever. I, I uh, didn't want to put it on because I haven't beat it. It's... No, um, that's the reason that it's getting an honorable mention is that it's really clever and then ended up being too clever for me so I didn't get very far in it <laughs> but I genuinely I love the idea of uh, Barbara's Eve and also like um, Dicey Dungeons excellent soundtrack in Barbara's yeah. Eve I said it on Twitter the other day but it is like uh, Tame Impala did a Mario soundtrack it's dopey it's something that you can chill out to just put on in the background and mosh out to it uh, ben, have you got any other honorable mentions? Yeah, uh, I'm just gonna throw quite a few out. Uh, Maud Howe, I don't even know where to put that. I, I would say it counts as yeah. a because that's a small team, small yeah. development. So yeah, all uh, right. That's a very cool game, very fun. I like it. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was the other one? I was oh, Cadence of Hyrule. It's just good fun. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Katana Zero, I had a good time with. Uh, and. Bloodstained, I haven't played enough of, mm. and I think I just like the fact that it exists more than playing it. No, that's fair. No, it is. It is the platonic ideal of a Kickstarter game, which is this is a game. This is a game genre or series. I'm not gonna get enough. I'm not gonna get from the people who used to make this. So I might as well go with the original creators and give them the money so it can happen again. It's just it's it's like the Mighty Number no. Nine story if it actually turned out all right. Which, yeah, well, you know. even like the um, yeah, actually, Shovel Knight doesn't really count though, does it? Because that's like that's more riffing yeah. on games like that. It's more like but a love it's, letter. It's, to the... it's it's from the creator, which I think is the. I guess it's more like ukulele, I, I suppose. Yeah. If ukulele which... turned out good. Mm. 
that we're gonna get Actually, into ukulele. Don't yeah, you worry. We're, I figured ukulele is gonna come up mm. at some point. Yeah, uh, Slay I've got the, some... oh, uh, I haven't played much Slay the Spire, but I think it looks cool, and I think I will enjoy it. And, okay. You know, uh, I think I think if I put in twenty hours into Slay the Spire by the time of this podcast, it would probably be my number one. Okay. But I played a few one. honorable mentions from me. Uh, John Wick Hex. I really like it because it's like XCOM, but also like it's like playing XCOM, but also like playing in Adobe Premiere Pro. It's like editing an action movie, but that's how you play the game. It's very cool. Um, does start to run out of steam though. Um, not too far into it, and very buggy is my only issue with it as well. But I hope that they get to polish that up, especially if they do a console release at some point, because I think console controls look really nice for it. Uh, Void Bastards. I really I really like it and I would say that if you've got Xbox Game Pass give I, it a go because it is the perfect it. game for that where it's not very big it's not it's essentially a roguelite you're getting something different every time but it's like a it's like a cool arcadey version of BioShock which isn't something that I thought I would ever get but it's something that I do like I also really like the look of it it's like a like it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek 2000 AD comic, but brought to life yeah. as a game, which is nice. Um, or oh dear, on the um, iPhone, very good. Uh, it is uh, Ben. I can't imagine you've ever heard of this. I'll basically explain. Um, you remember in Super Mario Galaxy where you get in the spiders' webs and you pull back on oh, them yeah. and that's and and you shoot Mario around. Mm-hmm. That's how this game works. But it's a yeah. 2D iPhone game and you're constantly moving up like a chasm. Okay. Yeah, it's cool funny. though because like you like the challenge is, is that you can only get onto certain slime parts. There's enemies bouncing around, and you also have to pick up like keys and stuff. It's neat. Uh, really nice aesthetic to it. Really nice. Uh, got recommended that by somebody in Heavy Eyed's Discord channel. So if he ever listens to this, uh, thank that person on my behalf. And finally, Cat Guns. Uh, Cat Guns is a free to play third person shooter. Uh, from itch.io, which I wouldn't yeah. have talked about if it wasn't for a uh, fork and indie bites is uh, raising money for the pets charity stream where I played a little bit of it. It's fun. It's a little bit like Quake. It's a little bit like Titanfall, but it's got cats and it's free. So hey, if you haven't got a lot of money but you want to play something which is like those games and you want to get like some people together, give it a go. So. Uh- and I'm I'm gonna do more honorable mentions. Oh my god, you've you've got even more. Okay. Uh, well, okay, kinda. Uh, first off, I want to mention Steam World Quest, which I didn't like as much as I hoped I would, but it was pretty good. Yeah. And uh, the others are kind of cheating because they are DLC. Uh, but I'm gonna mention. Uh, shit. What was it? Okay. Um, Shovel Knight, which is the DLC isn't out yet, but King Knight is coming soon, and I think it will probably be very good. Were the other two good? Yes, I I okay. love both of them. Uh, yeah, no, I I think they're amazing. Uh, the Messenger DLC came out, which I haven't finished yet, but I really like the Messenger, so it's just you know it's more Messenger, it's good. And the Celeste DLC, which is also extremely good. Okay, um, Celeste actually came out this year. Oh no, Celeste no. came out last year. Yeah, January two thousand eighteen. Oh wow. Oh, for some reason I thought it was out earlier this year, but I, I think guess we had not. this discussion already, actually. Yeah, I think we have had this discussion many times before. Still haven't got around to playing Celeste. I will do at some yes. point. I got gifted Celeste for doing a commission for somebody, and still haven't got around to playing it, but I will do at some point. Uh, anyway. Ben, we better move yes. on, though. Uh, and the next one is the re-gift. Now, this is... Uh, I think this is a good concession for Ben here, who... <laughs> Wanted to talk about games that didn't come out yeah, this there's year. There's going to be a lot of honorable uh, mentions, I think. Yeah, funnily enough. I think we could talk about every game that came out between 1977 and 2018 yeah. in this one. But uh, So basically, this was something that was once loved, and it's now ready to be loved again. Maybe an old jumper, maybe some cutlery, or uh, something that you want to move on, you know, a bottle of wine that you're not going to drink, but you want to move it on to somebody else. And again, these games are kind of fall under the same thing of... Stuff that came out before 2019, but we are discovering them for the first time in 2019. We're falling in love with them all over again. So this isn't just talking about like, oh, I played the the biggest game of 2004 in 2019. This is stuff which feels resonant in this time that we're in, and and has and has affected us in a way that only the the best of the best of 2019 has. 
So Ben, what is your re-gift of uh, 2019? Okay. I don't know if it fits that category entirely, but um, okay. there are a lot of games I've. So I I always detail. I I, put, I make a list of every game I play in the year, and okay. I give them a score. I give them just a quick one to ten, just so I have a a baseline on how much I enjoyed it. Uh, and I give about fifteen different games ten. Uh, how do you how do you base your scoring system well? Uh, ten ten for me is just uh, I okay. Basically, if a game ends and I'm sad that it's over, that to me is a ten, kinda. If the game's short, okay. I just mean I just mean more in regards to do you need the entirety of a ten point scale? Uh, I mean, I've given something a one for the first time this year. But this is the thing, like you know, it's like uh, if you're bad at bowling, where you're at, well, well, it's like that bowling where you either you're only getting like strikes or gutter balls. Where if you only have ones and only have tens, then why not have like a two point rating nah, scale? I've got, I've got, I've got everything from one to ten this year, I believe. Okay, oh, that's yeah. fine, that's fine. Uh, but I've okay, maybe not twenty tens. I think I've given about eight tens. Uh, and okay. one of them, I think the one I most want to talk about is it should be Robo Clean uh, Clean Sweep. Uh. Okay. Right. We we we're gonna have to. We were gonna we were gonna get to this part of the podcast anyways. <laughs> this is gonna, this is gonna come up for some point. Okay, yeah, so... Ben. Try. All right. Convince me on the non the not ironic value of Chibi uh, Robo. It's then it's not ironic, but okay. So Chibi Robo, he's a little robot lad. He came out in two thousand and four, I think. Uh, actually. Um. Uh. People at home, if you don't know this, a uh, Chibi is a Japanese word for like small or cute. Yes. Robo is a shortening of robot. Mm -hmm. Here you go. Combine the two together and you're a small cute uh, robot. 2005. His first game was in 2005 at the GameCube. And it's mm. a... I'm going to call it a Metroidvania. Uh, <laughs> it's a 3D uh, exploration game. You're, you're a little robot mm -hmm. who climbs around a house and cleans. Okay. And you, yeah, you're, you're adopted by a family, essentially. And your, your job is to clean stuff. And you go around with your uh, toothbrush, cleaning the floor. And it's very good. I like the sound design a lot. Uh, it's got a lot of character. Uh, it's got the, the toys are alive and you can talk to them. It's like Toy Story. And it's a very cute, mm. quirky Japanese game. Uh, you can liken it to Katamari. Or uh, there's a... there's a They call it the Love the Lit Games. The, um, an old Japanese developer. Like Tulip. Yeah, Tulip. Uh, Little King story. Uh, they're all rule of rose. Yeah, they're all s sort of by the same developers that have gone on to do other stuff. And yeah, yeah, it's it's one of those. And yeah, it's cool. But it got sequels. Uh, first was a DS sequel called Park Patrol, which was okay. Mm. Uh, it's very repetitive, but it's cute, and I enjoyed it enough. Unfortunately, didn't release outside of uh, Japan and America. And in America, right. it was exclusive to Walmart. Okay. Yeah. Uh, not exclusive to like a console. No, it's exclusive to Walmart. Uh, fun fact. So you could only play it in Walmart, yeah. is what you're saying. Uh, pretty much. Okay. Uh, yeah. Small fact about Chibi Robo series: they've never done a very good job at uh, keeping it alive. You don't say. No. I th he's been on life support since he started. Which is ironic, because he's a robot, yeah. so he shouldn't need it. Uh, but then, uh, the then they released Clean Sweep, which is uh, it's got a Japanese name. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, you don't need to say it, Ben. Yeah. You're not going to impress anybody uh, by saying the Japanese name. It uh, it's a late DS game, I believe, because uh, it the the graphical leap between Park Patrol and Clean Sweep is is big, uh, and yeah. it feels like a late DS game. It it's it's very free it's a three D sort of thing and it looks good. Sure. And so then there were two more which weren't very good on the three DS. And Clean Sweep's the only game like the original. Uh you're in a house, you clean. And it's just it's very good. Okay. I don't wanna I'm 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 not antagonizing the Chibi Robo. I am okay. respecting the decision, but give me two other games that we all that you gave tens to this year. Okay. Two other games. Maybe at opposite ends of the spectrum of uh, Clean Sweep. Uh, Bayonetta 2. Okay. And We Love Katamari. 
I could see the similarities between Wheel of Katamari and uh, Chibi Robo because they're both small characters that kind of interact with Big World. What elevates Clean Sweep above those two titles for you? Uh, I think okay. It I'm probably like Bayonetta two more. Maybe I don't know. But it's not your. I. <laughs> it's not your. I don't feel like I. I don't year. feel like I discovered Bayonetta two though. I I played it. Whereas, like, getting through the Chibi Robo series, it did feel like a discovery. Okay, so they are, alright, so they are totally fresh to you. Alright, okay, yeah. no, I can respect that then. Um, what made you want to get into the Chibi Robo games thought, in 2019? Cute. Um, <laughs> that was it, you were motivated <laughs> purely by the aesthetic yeah, qualities no, of it. Um, I just thought he was a, but, a li- nothing. About, do, do you feel like he resonates with you on a deeper level? Do you feel like you and him have like, much in common? Okay, we'll tell us a little. We'll talk. Talk us through it. He he doesn't have. He doesn't talk. He just kind of. He he can say yes and no. Uh, he has like a okay. little, uh, sign that comes out his head. Uh, he gives right. a. He has a. Uh, he has two emotions. One of them is Chibi Robo, and the other one is squinting. <laughs> okay. Uh, and he can squint in a lot of scenarios. If he doesn't like something someone says, uh, or he want he has to do some begrudgingly, he'll squint about okay. it. And he just cool. he kind of gets on with it. And so what you're saying is, is that he's got very simple expressions, but his actions speak louder than words. Yeah, he's he do, he's not somebody who expects you to say, "Oh, good job, Chibi Robo," or whatever. Mm. He just gets on with things. He just powers on. You know, he he knows what his existence is for, and he knows that through doing these small jobs every day, bit by bit, he would he's making change in people's lives and he's well, making that's people the happy. Thing. The the first game is about uh features divorce as a subject matter. Yeah. Uh, the second game features poverty, and. Okay, the, I didn't know the that. Death of I a... knew the divorce, but I didn't know about poverty. The death okay. of a loved one. Um, okay. And resurrection. The devil. What? <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you meant like the resurrect, like the like Chibi Robo dies like Jesus, but then he comes back. Well, in the first one, he does. He dies, and then Telly thinks he's dead, <laughs> and then Telly's crying about it. He's like, "No, Chibi Robo, don't die." Um, and then he comes back to life, and he's all right. Um. Oh my but no, God. in this one you're resurrecting okay. a human, and they become a, and then they possess a frog. It, I. It makes sense in context, no. I'm sure. <laughs> okay. It, it's a very bizarre series. It has so much charm, and like the reason I like uh, Clean Sweet more than the original is that uh, story's probably better. I don't know. I kind of go back and forth. The gameplay is just. I was so going to say much... yeah, because if you've played all the Chibi, if you've played all the Chibi Robots th- this year, what is it that? Of that of of Queen Sleep that brings it above the GameCube original and the second one. Well, the second one. one is barely. I mean, it's a completely different. Oh no, you said yeah. the second one isn't okay. So uh, compare it to the so like people have been comparing Luigi's Mansion Three to uh, Luigi's Mansion Two in the original. Again, people don't like Two because of the structure of it. Again, I will concede that the structure of Two isn't very good. Although I would say it fits perfectly on a 3DS. Uh, the MO with a 3DS, but. Like comparing three to one, I would say three is a far has a far better structure than um. There's nothing in. I'm trying to. Th- I'm, I'm actually trying to think of like I I, I want to try and think of something that I can be nice about Luigi's Mansion one, but there is nothing in it that I don't feel was done better in the mm. third one. Uh, I'd say, uh, the, like story, I guess. Uh, the, uh, the character of Luigi and like him commenting on stuff and. No, I feel like, like that's done better in the no, third one. Though. On I feel anything. like you get more character out of yeah. him because the the fidelity's better, you know? I don't know. I, I think, but I think it's so, the lore but, of but, you know, stuff in the original. Like the, okay. the lore of no, the ghosts fine. and whatever. But but I'm just using yeah. a contrast here. I'm talking about we're talking about the robos yeah. at the so moment. So So what is it? Yeah. You you do the same thing. You go around the house cleaning. Uh you're doing it for different reasons. In the first game you're just kind of doing it for no particular end goal. Yeah, like you. Okay. Eventually, an end goal becomes clear in the first game. You find like a big robot that okay. needs to be resurrected, and uh, you sure. you have to power up its battery by getting money, and then you have to find its leg, and that's kind of just <laughs> yeah. In this one, you're okay. raising money for the family, uh, and okay. as you clean the house, uh, and this is something I really like, 
uh, you get to basically if you clean certain parts of the house, you can unlock uh, nicer looking versions. The house is uh, looks shit. Like the walls are all torn, yeah. the couch is fucked up. But like as you clean all these so areas, than... they actually replace it with like nicer so... looking stuff. So in the first one, your kind of your goal seems a bit abstract, and it seems completely not selfish, but like the family's not going to benefit from having the big robot and you pump battery and it replaces. It's like in this one, though, you are making a genuine difference yeah. in their lives. Okay, I have respect. Yeah. All right, and you can buy new stuff for the family, which is cool. You can go on a shopping channel and like buy them a fridge because they don't have one, um, and a shower because they don't have one. All right, and. Yeah, no, you, it feels like you're making more of a difference. Uh, they buy, they get new outfits as the game goes on, like actual nice clothes. And there's sure. sort of messages about how materialism isn't the best, and, you know. Uh, <laughs> okay, com- Comrade Robo, is, uh, <laughs> he's got some they, ideas. Has he? They do one thing, which is uh, I, they made Traversal so much better. Uh, Traverso in the first okay. game. No, that's I, I think that's always appreciated in any sequel is that they make it easier to play or just yeah. more enjoyable the, to Traverso play. Traverso in so. the first game is you go up to stuff, you can climb certain things, and it's it's whatever. There's a helicopter attachment that lets you just uh, float a little. Uh, yeah. And in the second game, because you have a plug, Chibi Robo has like a little plug on the back of him, uh, and you can actually swing it round and use it as like you can throw it into plug sockets. Yeah, and they basically you you can upgrade your plug as the game goes on, and eventually it becomes like fifty centimeters long. Um, okay. and what you can do is you can plug in, uh, to a plug socket, and then dangle off of like a, a wardrobe, or anything, and just like essentially oh, like your like your abseiling yeah. kind of thing. Okay. And they use that a lot in a lot of cool ways. You can like abseil down stuff. Okay, so it's got a good sense of scale to it. Like yeah. they do play with how small the character. All right. And once All right. you get to like the end of the game, and your your cord is so long that you can basically just fling it from. You're like low on battery, and you need a quick fix, and you can just fling it from one side of the room to the other into a plug socket. Yeah. And like it just it feels good. It feels very good to do. And okay. Uh, oh, also cleaning is more important now because. You you have to recharge uh, often because he he runs out of battery. And not that I, not that I'm keeping an eye on the clock or anything. Although yeah. we have been talking about Jimmy Robo for the past half an hour. Um, c- could you uh, g- give us a nice? What if would you want him to come back in 2020? Yes. And how would you? F- how should he come back? Uh, a classic game, style the first one and the third one. Uh, possibly maybe just a remake of both of them. I think would be good as a uh, fresh as a switch kind of yeah. thing. Okay. Um, because then I mean it never released out of Japan. I'm playing it on a fan translation, obviously. Uh, I played it on an original mm. DS though. Okay. And yeah. Um, do you feel he's reflective of this moment that we're in? Do any of the characters remind you, say, of maybe an American president who's trying to break up families? Meanwhile, little little <laughs> robes. He's trying to, you know, he's doing praxis. He's trying to bring I stuff think together. You they know, they could make, a, they could have a message about climate change, a hundred percent, in Chibi Robo. The next one should be about. Do you think about... could get Greta in it? Do you think she could shake? Yeah. like she could use like a little finger yeah. to shake Chibi Robo's hand. I think hand. she, hundred percent, that game could be about climate change and the importance. Do you about think the that in the next Chibi Robo game they should have, um, like, Chibi Robo rather than like cleaning somebody's house? He's on the Sanders campaign. <laughs> He's he's just like traveling yeah. with Bernie across the country. He's just doing he's just doing picketing. He's, he's got he's just he's knocking cleaning, doors. Um, he's just doing he's the work. Cleaning uh, his car. Yeah, he's cleaning cars in the community. He's meeting with um you know African Americans mm-hmm. and uh, you know LGBT people, and he's like being like, yeah, I'm listening to you, even though my ears are very small. I am listening to yeah. you, you know. Okay. okay. And I I, yeah. I I appreciate that. Uh, ben, what do you think uh, my? Uh, <laughs> what do you think my? I don't. I can't even remember what the name of the segment was because all I can think of is Chibi Robo. What do you think my regift oh, is? Oh god, it could be anything. It, it literally could be anything. Uh, is it a game you've talked about quite a bit on the podcast? But I think I have actually. Huh. Uh, give me. Do you want yeah, me? To, just, do you want me? Yeah. Do you want me to give some yeah. clues? 
Well, first things first, it's not one game, it's a few games. And not only right. that, but it's a double barrel. Uh, you know, remember that I said that for the first, for the BMX, I was only going to pick one game out of three games. This is technically two games that I'm going to be pitching. Okay, so it's not my... Ace Attorney. Hmm. No, one of them is Ace Attorney. Oh. Right. So what's what do you think the second one is? Uh, Ace Attorney Trials and Tribulations? I don't know. Hey, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll make it a bit easier. Okay. So the Ace Attorney trilogy okay. is one half of right. this. So you are cheating. I am cheating a little bit, but I will explain why. Okay. Uh, does it, is it related very to, similar... to it? Yeah, they are related. Well, Did you play it for the first you, time this I was year? Pl- yes, and I was playing both these games at the same time. Oh, okay, yeah, I know what it is then. Danganronpa. Danganronpa, Trigger Happy Havoc. So, Ace Attorney Trilogy by Capcom, and Danganronpa, Trigger Happy Havoc by Spike Chunsoft. Now, the second Spike Chunsoft there is a reason why... Today. The second What's that? Spike Chunsoft game today. Yeah, because we talked about AI, Summon the Summon Files, which, I don't know, maybe you can use this uh, section to talk about the connection between uh, Trigger Happy Havoc and that. But, there is a reason why I'm talking about them both together, and it's not just because of the fact that both you and friend of the show, Snake, a.k.a. Patrick, a.k.a. The Boss's Son, a.k.a. Leo Gold, recommended these games to me. But it's because of how they both approach a similar genre, which I hadn't really been accustomed to before. Which, I don't want to call it a visual novel, because I feel like they do a little bit more than a traditional visual novel I does. I would call them a visual novel. I I was gonna call I was gonna call them adventure games mm. because I feel like they kind of fall and I don't mean like adventure like an uncharted game I mean like more in the classic point and click style of it. Yeah, I don't know. I I guess kind of. I I I feel I I feel like they kind of they do go over a couple of different genres, but they are very much like each other though, because at the heart of both games. They're about solving mysteries in the fashion of classic detective novels. Murder as in, mysteries. You know that there, there is an end point to like all these mysteries before you even put the game into the cartridge slot in, and started it up. These mysteries have already been written and they've already been solved by the designers. And then they work backwards and mm-hmm. say, how did we get here? And that's where you start, where you go, okay, there's been a murder. Who's the culprit? How did they do it? Why did they do it? And as you play, you start to ship away that stuff. And in Danganronpa, it's a lot more apparent that that's the <laughs> thing because it is a game about uh, kids in a school of murder. And then in Ace Attorney, sometimes it's not always a murder. Sometimes it starts off as a normal crime and then becomes a murder. Well, usually murder does factor its way into quite not a usually. lot of different mysteries. Uh, all but one Ace Attorney trial in the series involves murder. I'm trying to think. So, okay, in the first game, Larry Butts' girlfriend gets murdered. Yeah. Then Mia gets murdered in the second one. Slight spoilers. And then in the... Yeah, okay. I should... Yeah, okay. I should warn, in this re-gifting section, even though Ben didn't spoil... Well, I guess... uh, You spoiled mechanical stuff with Tribby Robo. I should say that because these are older games, I may be spoiling some stuff related to Even though the Ace Attorney Trilogy came out this year. Even though... Yeah, sorry. (laughs) The Ace Attorney Trilogy, I played it for the first time this year on Nintendo Switch. As long as I don't explain who Mia is, we're all right. Okay. Okay, and then in the third one, it was... Uh, some guy who was an actor. Oh, it's the Steel Samurai. Yeah, yeah. And that person gets murdered as well. Yeah, everyone get... There's a murder in every trial. Yeah, that's what I mean. Everybody gets yeah. murdered in um, Ace Attorney. One, it's there's great. There's one trial in the whole series that doesn't have a murder in it. And it's actually in The Great Ace Attorney. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm trying to think back, like, because I was thinking of the one, you know, the one who, with the guy who and he steals the um the the Maya vase, mm-hmm. and then that turns into a murder case, yeah. and it's like, what the fuck? Yeah. Um, I really like these games though, because for one thing, they're not, they are visual novels in regards to they don't fuck around too much with like, like they don't throw in like too many mini games and stuff. It is purely you're talking to people, you're investigating stuff, you're finding like items to kind of bolster your case. 
Um, but they are different enough that they are good on their own kind of own points. Again, I kind of find it, found it very hard to split these two up because, again, they both are tackling the same subject material and they I kind of have them both sort of connected in my head. But they do two, they do things differently enough that they are they do kind of... So yeah. Danganronpa, I think, should be the one that I start with because it's certainly the one that I wasn't expecting to like. Like, I already played Apollo Justice, but that was when that game came out. So I was pretty much going into the Ace Attorney trilogy completely blind when I played it. And But Danganronpa, I had absolutely no ties to it before I played it for the first time. As for reference, I played all the Danganronpas, except for the Ultra Despair Girls, and I played all the Ace Attorneys, and I played them all in 2015-16, slash and then V3, which came out in 17. So, yeah. Yeah. Ben, Ben, he's been around. Been around the, the Danganronpa series. and the Ace Attorney block. He's been on that Dangan train for a while. Um, I really the thing that I like most about Danganronpa and the thing that separates it from Ace Attorney is its aesthetic. It's very clean. I like, and I don't just mean how it looks, but like its user experience and its user. In, everything is tied together around. The, and this is the thing, I didn't quite realise this until I got towards the end, but I, everything is tied around guns. Yes. And I know this sounds really weird, especially if you say a visual novel, and I was saying they're not very aesthetically <laughs> complex, but the way that you inter you play this game and the way that you get around, it looks and plays like Doom, which is really weird. All the whole, like, there's, like, rather than, like, most games where you have a menu and you say, oh, take me here or take me here, and you get, like, a, a flat representation of those rooms with some characters in it. No, everything's, be like, they're 3D modeled environments that you can kind of look around. Yet, all the characters in the game and most, like, props and stuff, they're all flat sprites that all rotate towards the camera, like Doom. Yeah. Which is really an interesting choice. And I didn't quite realize this until when you then get into the trials where the way that you engage in stuff and the way that you have arguments is you literally shoot contradictions with evidence. Yeah. And I, and I don't mean this in regards to like, you know, oh, you know, I, I'm going to click on something. No, you literally, you have to aim it like a first person You have shooter. truth bullets that you can shoot. You have truth and bullets. And your truth cylinder that you can switch between like a revolver. And yes, it's very cool. They even in V three, um, they give you a, a gun for the investigation sections, kind of, and oh, that's you cool. can just break stuff, um, and you get oh, coins out neat. of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I thought you meant no. more like, uh, like if you shoot a vase, like it will nah. flip it around and you can see like more to you can it. Just, you can just nah. shoot stuff and break them and make rooms okay, very bad. I like that though. And and again, and I like how it, it it goes all in on this kind of weird gun yeah. metaphor for stuff. And they do even some um, weird stuff with it in two and three as well. I like that then. Um I really like how it looks and I'm not a massive fan of anime, even though one of my honorable mentions this year was going to be um Neon Genesis, <laughs> Neon Genesis Evangelion. Evangelion. Yeah. Um but um I like how it looks. It's kind of it's not like like they kind of lean into how weird this premise is so it kind of almost looks a bit like tim burton stuff which i quite like mm -hmm. um it's neat it as a concept as an idea that single game is very neat and the mystery is as it's split up and how it kind of goes along it's been it's done really well like not there's very there's very little in it where it kind of felt like it came out of left field, which I think is a good sign of a well written mystery, where even when weird stuff happens, it feels nicely like you could kind of see that there was telegraphing towards some of that stuff. Yeah, it gets you know a what bit I mean? fucky at the end, I'd say. Yeah, the end does start to. Although I don't know when the main when the reveal happens at the end, which I'm not going to spoil because that is probably the biggest thing in that game. I kind of had that inkling going along that this is a potential factor in this yeah. that perhaps somebody could do this, and that might be an interesting reveal towards the end. The thing that I wasn't too keen on was they have that reveal, but there's no real reason for it. There's no payoff. There to isn't it. till the anime. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's what I mean. I feel like it's one of those things that, oh, I need to carry this on into something else to get yeah. a full thing for it. Ace Attorney hasn't got that issue, no. though. But And I prefer Ace Attorney more because I like lawyer stuff. So do I. And I like watching people get creative within like specific rule sets. And like law is like the most specific rule set for anything like on earth which is cool like you get to essentially like phoenix Wright's superpower as he thinks outside the box again though it would be nice if they could let you the person at home do a lot of that stuff versus how they usually do it where they give you free options and one of them's a weird option but then it turns out if you click on that one that's how yeah. you continue the story which it's, is i mean there's been lots of debates about like, how mystery games can be done better and I, I yeah. at this point I think the best examples of it are probably Oberdin and Telling Lies slash I forgot the name of it, Her Story yeah I really, yeah I liked uh, his yeah actually yeah that's a good point I didn't, I didn't, I didn't when I was playing these games I had I, Her Story didn't even kind of factor in for me for that because I think it's just how you play these games are also different. Well, with her story, it's just kind of like you watch clips and you kind of make notes and stuff, and you go, "Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Let's see what the link is with that." Which I feel, yeah, which I think feels more like I, traditional sort of police. I do work. think the problem is when you're making a more character focused story game that it it inherently has to be a little more linear and uh, guiding. You know what the interesting thing is? I feel like we're gonna. I kind of want to carry this point on into the next, uh, the next award that we're given. But I will explain. Okay. Uh, but I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to make a bullet out of this, like you can in uh, Danganronpa. Yeah. But and then I'll use it when we get to that. My part. final thing but, is, I, I don't believe you've played the best Ace Attorney game or the best Danganronpa game yet. So I no, think you have I will to get look back to them to. at. I will get back to them at some point. I will say, though, the, getting back to the questions that I kind of said to you, which was, why now? Why can't... And again, I think with Ace Attorney, the reason I started playing them is because... I mean, the, there was a trilogy of those games around the time anyway. Like, they've been around since the DS. Yes. Uh, you know, Game Boy. The trilogy. Of, Advance. Well, the original three games were on the Game Boy Advance, and then they put them together as a trilogy for the DS, yeah. didn't they? Uh, only... Uh, no, it wasn't a trilogy. It was three releases. Uh, it's just, but then they did a trilogy for the 3DS. Yes, and the I iOS and Android. And they did iOS ports. And I think there was a Steam port at some point before no, the other ones uh, as well. That, no, that came with the... Um, that that came with yeah. the Steam one. Okay. So they have been around for a while. And Dungeon Romp has obviously been around for a while as well. But I think there's just something this year that I kind of really got into mystery stuff. And like those kind of like unraveling kind of games which again i think is going to be something that goes into our next segment but i really like how they're done and i would say that they feel like games that could come back at any point like but even more than that i'm shocked that there is no u.s developers who have kind of figured these games like tried to do the, like the only games that i can kind of think of are like the telltale style yeah. style games but they feel more like they're stuck in the kind of the thing of you know we need to make them more like third person games like if anything making them more like kind of split the difference between say ace attorney and mass effect where they have to kind of balance the gameplay stuff with the story stuff which I think if you went all in on doing the story stuff, you'd end up with a better... But then, thinking about it, there are a lot of developers who aren't like... Because I think when you think that a lot of this stuff, you're kind of thinking of like the, the AA or the AAA developers, like the known names. But there are people like who do visual novels and do twine... St like I was like... So I'd be like Christine Love, Anna Andropy, and Zoe Quinn have been doing stuff like this for years. Mm. Like the twine community has been going for like as long as twine has been a thing and i would say that they're probably the nearest kind of thing to games like this yeah i don't know I don't what's your I, thought on that i'm trying to think if i've played any games that are like ace attorney that are from the west but i can't think of anything no like a, a there's a there's avian a, attorney, attorney but i think that's kind of more of a joke is very good i'd say uh yeah 
and it's it, it does feel like an Ace Attorney parody for the most part. Yeah, it feels like it is definitely aping the look and feel and the mechanics of Ace. Like, I mean, kind of more in regards to like you take Ace Attorney as a base and then you kind of do your own thing yeah. on it. I can't think. Where of I that. feel like with a lot of Western stuff, it's more kind of based in doing you know like following a like more like a traditional point and click adventure game where you have like one character and you point on stuff and you say oh i need this vase so i can solve this puzzle kind of thing where ace attorney you have that aspect to it but you're basically you're building a case up for then going into a courtroom where i think like a courtroom based game would be really cool yeah. like in 3d you know yeah. Or even like a Danganronpa kind of thing where it was more of like a murder mystery thing and it's, you don't have a court case at the end, but it's more like, or like Clue, you know, where you then face a group of like potential murderers and you put your case together, you know? Yeah. Both really neat games. Um, What do they say about where we are in 2019? Well, a lot of grifters on YouTube, a lot of people who say a lot of bullshit <laughs> and you need to go in there and you need to do critical thinking and you need to apply theory and you need to debunk these people. And these are two games that teach you the the mechanics to start thinking about how to do yeah, such a thing. I feel like I've learned a lot about when are they gonna? When are they going to make a Ben Shapiro Danganronpa mm. where you shoot Ben Shapiro's words with word bullets and you just show just graphs shoot, of actually... Can we just no, shoot Ben Shapiro? <laughs> <laughs> no, you have to get his bar down before you mm, can do that, okay. though. Right. And you, we have to, we have to, we have to play fair on this. Okay. Well. Now moving on. Anyways, fourth segment. I feel like you know it's a good thing with this is the Christmas yeah. episode because we don't have to keep an eye on the clock for this one. Uh Krakatoy. What is a Krakatoy? Well, some people, when they have Christmas dinner, they have crackers, and you pull the crackers, and sometimes a, a little thing falls out, like, say, a little spinning top, or, like, a little pad and pen, or, like, a ruler. Uh, measuring tape's always usually a good one out of those. But basically, it's something that we like, or liked, but you wouldn't call it a video game at all. Maybe it was something on your computer, maybe it has game-like elements, but they're not going to sell it at Game Station. Well, they're not going to sell it at Game Station anyways because they went into administration. Um, they're not going to sell it at like Game or HMV yeah. or on Amazon or whatever as a video game. This is this can be anything, and I think because of the sort of the parameters of this, this doesn't have to be something that came out in 2019. But maybe it's something that didn't come out in 2019, but maybe came into its own in 2019 or kind of touched us in 2019 or whatever. I don't know, Ben. What's your choice? Uh, I'm going to throw it to you because I I don't have one yet. So I kind of want to hear yours. And okay. Yeah. I was gonna use. I was gonna do the guessing thing, but I think because this subject is mm. so kind of broad, it's quite hard to do so. So, uh, my choice for my character this year is Dungeon World. Yeah, okay, I figured you were gonna say but that. In particular, in particular, the Monster of the Week campaign. Oh. So, it's a Dungeon World by uh, Sage Latora and Adam Coble, and the Monster of the Week campaign, which was by uh, Ben... Uh, I'll cut that out, uh, because I don't want my... <laughs> <laughs> oh, just bleep yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, why Dungeon World? I mean, technically, I could have done this last year, because that's when we had started playing it. But I think this year was when it started to kind of come more into its own, and we kind of got more, uh, kind of, our feet on the ground. So... So explain to people at home what Dungeon World is. Uh, hey, do you know what Dungeon and Dragons is? Yeah. Basically, it's it's that, but it's been tweaked oh, like to be Dragons. more about. Um. Yeah. I'm. I have tried. Uh, so a, a friend friend of the show fork has ran was very kind and did run a game of fifth edition D and D for me, which I didn't mind. But there's certain elements to that game that I don't get on with like a lot of it is quite a lot slow paced and very kind of maths yeah, driven and numbers there's, driven i there's too much to treat, keep track of in D and I there's too many mechanics i guess is what i'd say there's like long spell lists and yeah and like before you can make any do anything you have to roll for initiative yeah. to see if you can even like achieve it which is kind of Whereas rubbish dungeon world no? is very loose you just kind of you're, you ask the DM, can I do this? And the DM will be like, yeah, I guess. 
My the thing that I like about it is that essentially it is a conversation between you and the GM where you say to the GM, I want to do this, and they go, okay, roll two d6. And essentially, if you get a ten or above, you can do exactly what you wanted to. If you get a six, sometimes you can do what you want to, but it goes horribly wrong, or just like the, your move what it just kind says, of fucks is up. It, uh, the G- the GM makes a hard move against you. Yeah, which one of them could be using your move or using your abilities against you, or it could be introducing a new threat. Essentially, it just kind of it keeps the plot moving. Whereas in D and D, if you kind of fail something, it kind of brings stuff to a halt, which is rubbish. This everything keeps moving forward. On a seven to nine, though, in Dungeon World is interesting because essentially it then turns into a question of right, you want to do this move, but it's going to cause it's going to open up potential threats like say you know you might the enemy might get an attack on you or you might lose something that you're holding or you might put somebody else in danger or something like that essentially it's kind of asking the player what do you want to do with this information and then it kind of gives the player a chance to say oh well let's carry on with it and see what happens or yeah let's go into another challenge or something like that you know you might want to take a hit just so you can get a hit on another character or something like that so it's more about role playing and it's more about character stuff and it's more about like being occupying in this little world. I mean, I'd say that because it is my first kind of proper role playing system, maybe that's why I like it a lot more than most. And I will say as well, a good GM always helps. Mm. And I will say once again, friend of the show Snake, aka Patrick, aka the bossist on aka Leo Gold, has been a very good GM for uh, the uh, Dungeon World games that we have played with him, which are traditional fantasy-style games. But this year, and the reason why I've put it on the list, is because uh, me and the host of Game Overtime, Ben, we've both kind of dipped our feet more into the system. And we have both GM'd games in Dungeon Uh, World. Spin-offs. I'm doing one at the moment, which is... Spin-offs of Dungeon World, essentially. So this is the thing, like, so like D&D, there are themed, there are different modules and different themed versions of Dungeon World. Uh, The one that I'm currently running is based on a system called Spirit of 77, although it has been heavily themed to include uh, copyrighted characters and settings from the works of Detective Comics, but please don't tell anyone. Meanwhile, Ben wrote, uh, based his on a system called Monster of the Week, which, as the name suggests, is more about... Uh, a group of people who it's solve your typical monster stuff. Monster, uh, weekly monster drama. Uh, it's Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Scooby yeah. Doo, The X Files, all kind of like all kind of fall under this. You're solving a mystery this. each week, and it all culminates in a big battle with a some monster of some sort. Yeah. And there's, all the classes are themed around that sort of thing. And again, I'm not. I'm not saying this. I'm not doing this to you know embarrass or to kiss butt, whatever. There's. Even though I did like Dicey Dungeons quite a lot, I haven't enjoyed anything this year as much as I have been playing a Jamaican priest with his good friend, a corporate sociopath, and a hillbilly in a tiny northern town fighting monsters. A tiny northern English town is what I based it on. A tiny northern English town. It has been very enjoyable. And, like, again, there is something liberating to games like this where it isn't just these are your buttons or these are your parameters it is the conversation of can i do this or i want to do this and it's like okay let's see what happens and then see if we can follow through into something else um and And, oh go on and because of the fact that you can have an effect on the story it does feel like you are affecting change and you are being collaborative with it where i mean you can say as a gm or not whether this was the case but how much change from what you initially envisioned was going to happen versus what did happen? Uh, to be honest, uh, I didn't. Oh, I didn't have a lot in mind at first. I guess. No, that's I, fine. But that's the yeah. thing. You the 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 key bit of information that I that I have gotten and from what most people say is. Don't plan too much. Just let the dice fall as it is, and just kind of that. That's when these kind of campaigns are at the best. Is when stuff unfolds. Essentially, there were definitely things in a session by session basis where I planned stuff to kind of go a certain way, and it didn't. But that's that is hmm. part of the fun of it. Uh, yeah, you can't. You do have to improvise a lot, and 
it is it is the it is the world's most complex improv yeah. sec- session which is good it is i certainly feel like it it has helped with this show in some aspects of uh, bouncing off back and forth of one another uh it was yeah but, it was my first time gming i'm pretty happy with it i i think it definitely got better I feel, as it went on. i think you did very well uh I think next time I'm going to try in something that's a lot like doing a mystery is hard. I'll say that. Like the way you have to. So this is the yeah. The, so this is what I wanted. To, the, so okay, I'm about to use my bullet that I made from um earlier from Dangan Romper, and I'm about to shoot you with it. There we go. Uh, yeah, planning mystery stuff is interesting because the campaign that I'm running is very much that where there is a mystery and you are slow. Like the team have been slowly unraveling it week by week, and a lot of it, I would say that the main mystery side of it, I did kind of plan out towards the beginning, and it has kind of played out almost as intended, except towards the end, where it has kind of gone in a different direction, has gone really interesting. And then a lot of it has just been if you guys have done something in the like in a previous session which was weird or had like an interesting fallout to it. I've just taken that and kind of built that into, okay, we're going to introduce something relating to that next week and see what happens. But it's interesting comparing that to, say, something like Ace Attorney or Danganronpa, where you don't really get a lot of flexibility in that aspect. I mean, you can't by design, because obviously they have to be... If you made a completely, you know, exponential game, it would be, you know, a million gig and it would never run kind of thing. But... It's interesting how they do tackle that stuff, though. They give you everything that you would need, for the most part, to solve stuff. Where it doesn't feel like... Like, I would say with a lot of Ace Attorney stuff that comes out of nowhere, sometimes is annoying, but then sometimes does make you feel clever of going, Oh, neat, I've noticed something, yeah, let's tap on that. While in a game that we would run, it would be more like... You would kind of ask the players to look for stuff and then it would kind of be decided by the roles how much they would find and more importantly how much they would kind of give you yeah but then there's but there's also the question of say if a player would want to say like oh i want to do this or this that you wouldn't have even figured out you go okay that might actually factor into the mystery quite a bit which again not that i can say what because i think it would well i don't want to ruin any surprises that has happened a few times in this campaign that I've been running, which I've been quite happy yeah. that that stuff has happened. But I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, I don't know. What's your thought I on think, it? Uh, I think the most interesting part of it is that way when you're running like a non-mystery sort of thing, there isn't an mm. end goal. I mean, maybe you have a sort of general idea of where you want things to go. Yeah. But th- th- you don't need to get players always to a certain point. They can really do whatever they want, and sure, yeah, you you could you could do zero planning whatsoever. Whereas with a mystery, inherently you need something to solve. You you can't just yeah. not plan that. And if you don't, if all the evidence that you've created doesn't get found, or you do really have then to like, that's an issue, yeah, yeah, it's it's challenging and. It's the question of, like, how much autonomy do you want to give a player mm. versus, like, how much... I mean, obviously, it's, like, respect and intelligence, but then it's also kind of a matter of, like... I, again, I think it is definitely down to kind of knowing your players and knowing, okay, what where do they usually look for stuff and how do they usually tackle stuff, which you can kind of build your mysteries and build your evidence around that. Mm. But then, I don't know, it's kind of like, do you have a mystery game where they, like, create evidence as they look for stuff? Or, like, you know, is that, like, a possibility... Is that, like, a solution to that problem? Or, you know... I don't know, it's... It is interesting. Like, I I do find this kind of stuff... Because, I mean, like, no one's... Apart from maybe, like, L.A. Noir, no one has done, like, a proper open-world-style detective game or puzzle-solving game on that scale. The problem with L.A. Noir is that everything is completely linear you look at a body and you can't move on until you've found all the key areas on it. You go, you have to go to certain shops to get certain bits of information. And then you have shootouts where like, there is no like I, solution I think, to that. You just have to run around and shoot the stuff. Closest we've gotten in that sort of thing. You, and it's fun. You know, I wanted, I, I did want to love Oprah Din, 
But I, f- I think the problem was, was that, and again, I think this is the problem that I had with Babel Z, which is I kind of got so overwhelmed by the amount yeah. of options that I had or like how to tackle it. I had no idea like where to start with it. And I know the game does make a point at, at the beginning. They give you that kind of tutorial section of walking through, you know, the guy shoots the gun and then you follow the bullet and stuff like that. But as I got more, like, after that part, I was just it's, completely it's lost. Hard. But, like, it gives you a lot of autonomy in how you get through Yeah, it. which I think, and again, I think that is the question of what, like, where's the balance? Like, how do you find the perfect balance of player autonomy and a satisfying, like, story to follow? Because I think at the end of the day, that's always the main thing, which is, even if you give the players all the autonomy in the world, they're still going to get to the final... There's always going to be one final end point. Like, they're not going to find a... The killer doesn't change based on what... Ev- well... The guilty person might mm-hmm. change based on what evidence they find, but the one true killer never really yeah. changes based on what happens. The How the murder happened never changes. So it's like... You know, rectifying those two things is interesting. Huh. And it's, it's almost impossible for a video game to accomplish. Yeah. I, I unless hey, uh Microsoft is a cloud services though. Mm. Now there's a there's a potential <laughs> solution to that. Um I, you know, I I feel like I have gone a bit into the weeds here though, talking about because yeah, no, at the end of the day though, Dungeon World is a really decent and flexible system for doing a lot of stuff in it it's just kind of ended up that both you and i have both decided to do mystery games yeah. and we've both kind of gone two different ways with how to oh well quite similar in some respects of kind of leading players through solving yeah. stuff but yeah it's i have really enjoyed it though so i've enjoyed I, running my game but i also really enjoy I, playing, I've enjoyed in your playing in campaign. your campaign and running mine as well i i think both are very yeah. fun things to do yeah, I would say so. if you're if if the people are listening at home, hey guys, talking to you directly now. If you have any interest at all in kind of games beyond just playing them, kind of how they work mechanically, and you know the amount of stuff that goes into making them work, I would definitely sit down, either try and join a tabletop group in your town or whatever, or try and maybe find one online. Unless you've kind of had experience with it yourself, then maybe try and GMing yourself because it is. It does change yeah. your brain it, in a lot of stuff. You first, do have to, but mm. you know, it. Yeah, it is incredibly satisfying, though. I will say the pay that you're gonna have a better game than anything you've played all year. Your imagination can do uh, ray tracing and HDR and all that mm-hmm. stuff. So yeah, uh, Ben, did you think of anything I while I said ideas. all that? Uh, okay, t- tell me right. about them. Okay. Or three ideas, actually. Uh, Okay. So, my first idea was Smash Bros. Tournaments. Okay. you know, I might go with that one. My second idea was Tier Lists. Why don't we do the first one and then kind of go into Tier Lists? Okay. Right, so so I've never been to any tournament before, let alone a Smash one. So, talk me through it. What's the... Uh, well, I mean, I know how they work. You go there and you, you know, and they have brackets and you play against yeah. people and then, you know, all that sort uh, of stuff. But it's, I don't know. It's just, it's kind of what you'd expect, I guess. You go, you play. Yeah. Uh, the nerves are very high. Uh, I can imagine. Yeah. And I've, I, I started attending in 2014, I want to say. But then stopped. Around the time of Smash for yeah. Wii U. I, yeah? I, I, I competed in okay. Wii U. And then I eventually stopped after a few months, uh, mm. or like six months, seven months ish, and kind of annoyed I did that because you know I could be a pro by now. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm. You could be Hungry yeah. Bucks or whatever his name is. Uh, but now I'm I'm going back with with Ultimate. It's kind of reignited my want to do so, and mm. yeah, no, I've uh, had a good time. So have you stuck? So have you stuck with Ultimate longer than uh, Smash for Wii U? Uh, in terms of competitive, kinda, yeah. Uh, I mean, we'll uh, see. Okay. It, it's only been a year, so it's. It's yeah. early. Well, that's still quite a long time. I, well, I mean, that's I, I stuck with good. uh Smash Four 
for the whole DLC cycle. But like wow. S- Ultimate seeming to have like a, a much longer DLC trickle. Uh what do you say that the the community around Ultimate seems to be a bit more not into it? I don't think that's the word I'm looking for, but maybe they're a bit more activated on it than maybe the community was for four years. No, there was a level of resentment from I know, a lot of I know, people. I know for, I know for uh, Smash for Wii U did have a really hardcore base, but I feel like Ultimate has kind of started to appeal to the people who maybe fell off. Maybe after Brawl, uh, maybe they only stuck of, with Melee. A lot of Melee players play Ultimate, uh, for starters. Okay. And it's also brought in a lot of new people due to the fact that it's on the Switch and it's just, you know, mm. it's in more people's hands. But yeah, no. Literally. Yeah, uh, it's just in general... Uh, a lot more people playing it and mm. I think people I, for the most part people like it more than Smash 4 uh, it's, um, it's so faster, I guess it's because more, more people are playing it yeah. the community around it I guess is healthier yeah. than Smash 4 Wii U as well which I imagine helps with the tournament yeah. scene and I think since I was attending there, a lot more tournaments have popped up around my area that's good uh, there was only one uh, a few years ago but now I can there's a few I could go to, and yeah, it's yeah. There's weeklies, there's monthlies, there's bi-monthlies, there's annual. There's all sorts. In in regards to setup, then, because I imagine that because like a lot of the old like uh, Street Fighter tournaments and stuff, they could have kind of appreciated that you could do that with like arcade machines and stuff, and then sort of in the Street Fighter Four days, like you could kind of move a three sixty and put it on a television. But I think that I imagine that the benefit that Ultimate has is that. You could play it on the device itself no, through Wi-Fi, no, actually, right? We don't. Uh, use... Oh wow, they do. They do. Do they go the hog for TV yeah, setups? Yeah, I, I think it is too but, small to play on the sure thing for two people, especially. No, but yeah, oh, absolutely. No, they, get, uh, they ask people to bring stuff, so like people will bring their Switch and dock and whatever, which is a lot easier to transport than a Wii That's U. That's cool. And also, yeah. a monitor sometimes, and like, you know, it works. So that, yeah, so it's still got that kind of like, even though it's a new game, it's still kind of got that classic, you know, you bring your LAN, yeah. you bring your TV thing with you. That's nice. And yeah, I've just enjoyed it. I don't know. I don't have much else to say. Well, I don't know. Talk, talk about, because I guess this kind of goes more outside of, again, like I think with my Dungeon World stuff, I think the reason that I really like is that obviously with video games, it is made by like, it could be made by one person or a hundred people or a thousand people, but like by design you don't really feel the people like you know there are voice actors and stuff in it and motion capture artists but it doesn't feel like you're really kind of communicating with them mm. at all when you play it versus obviously something like dungeon world or like D where the people are the play yeah. you know the people are the players and the players are the characters like there is a very tiny amount of space between the reality of somebody and the fantasy and i imagine that like playing smash kind of has that appeal to it as well that it isn't just people online. It is people in a place who are... They're going to tournaments because they are there to play Smash competitively. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what they want. Like, so that's the mindset that they are in. They are... As much as when you play Dungeon World or when you play D&D, you are making the agreement that we are inside the Magic Circle now. We are making the agreement that we are playing as these characters. We are thinking as they will and the decisions that they will make. Mm-hmm. You're going along to the Smash tournaments and it's like, I am playing Smash competitively. This is how, like, you know, this is how I am going to talk to people. But then through that is, I imagine there must be kind of like, you meet people through there and you kind of like, there is that feeling of community to it. Yeah, I mean, I haven't, like, I, not yet, uh, in terms of meeting a lot of people. Um no, and I know, and obviously, because, yeah, again, it's a personal question as well, because obviously you don't want to be like, oh, yeah, I've met Jim, I've met John, and yeah. all that sort of stuff. But, like, you know, it is still, it's different to online multiplayer stuff, mm. though, isn't it? Just by design. Yeah. There is an energy in that room that you will never get through it's a lot speakers friendlier. and a fiber. Uh, people yeah, are nice. that's interesting. Uh, you can sit down and play with people and just have a nice time, talk to people. Do you- do you think it's just because there's no anonymity to it? Like... Yeah. Uh, I mean, ev- oh. everyone's just pleasant to be around, I guess. That's People good. People will give you tips on how you're playing. and. Uh... I mean, it was the one thing that I always noticed with, like, Evo and stuff is 
everybody is still, like, you know, even though you have, like, hype beasts and stuff like that, everybody is still very kind of, like, you know, good game yeah. and, you know, Especially earlier in the about it. It's, like, oh, absolutely. the stakes are just not as high. And especially with the lower, yeah. like, I, I'm i not on high level yet. Um, so, you know, no one's really playing, thinking, oh, I'm gonna try and destroy this person and win and well, no, absolutely. No, you don't go in there as a villain. You go in there because you realize that, you know, even if, like, you could be the best Smash player, but if you're Adolf Hitler, no one wants yeah. to play with you. That's the thing. Yeah, no. So, no, I I, I totally get it. But, oh, that's cool. Yeah. It has given me a new appreciation for Smash, that's for sure. But, how does this relate to tier lists? Uh, I, it, was, it was just another thing I was thinking about. Uh... We'll, t- we'll, t- we'll, we'll spill your brains. What, what, what are you thinking It's kind of gamey. It, it's a fun little it challenge is of like taking things that you like and or don't like and just... Ranking them. Ranking them. It's, it's something inherently people like to do. I've done it a lot. Fun- funnily enough, calls back to the question that I asked of how can you rate a game out of 10? Which I imagine that most... Because my rating system for games is literally... I will put every game like I will put them on like cue cards, and then I will swap places with them just based on the question of do I prefer this game over this game? And you know, a lot of the time it's kind of arguable of like, well, how can you compare a racing game and a uh, you know and a shooting game because they're two very different kinds of mechanics? So it's kind of like, well, what what am I? What would I always be in the mood for? What? You know what's quicker to get into? You know how how quickly can I you know get from normal to enjoyment in something? And you know factoring in that sort of stuff, which you know is cool. I mean, with a lot of tier list stuff, you kind of do have to think outside the box because you know if you're if you're comparing like yellow Pac Man and blue Pac Man, they're completely identical apart from their colors. So it's like, well, now I have to factor in this aspect, yeah. and you know it's subjectivity, which is. Big buzzword of the yeah. the past few but years, tier, especially tier lists are just because they don't have to be like ranked within the tiers. You can obviously, no. but you you're oh, basically sure. just putting them into categories. And I think humans we we like categories. We do it's, like categorizing it's, it's stuff. It's nice we... to just stick things in boxes and. No, absolutely. I, uh, yeah, it, it's it's how our brains. Are designed to work is by we put information in packets and we put them in brackets it just makes stuff easier to compartmentalize because if you had to think of everything on an individual basis you you know your brain wouldn't work yet yeah. red and yellow and blue they're all completely different yeah. yeah if you bracket them all under colors that's easier to think about you know primary colors again you can get even more specific about it and yeah i can see the same thing with and yeah it's I can see it being entertaining just as that challenge, though, of like, you know, how do you rectify between thing A and thing B? Is A better than B? Are they both on the same level? And, you know, why is that? So, and I can see that being the case in Smash. Well, I mean, obviously that has to have oh. tier lists because, you know, some characters are S rank and some are F rank, you yeah. know? Yeah, uh, tier lists are very, very important to Smash. Uh, yeah. They've been around for longer than tier maker was a thing. Yes. And I imagine that the uh, a lot of the community aspects of Smash is those kind of debates over, you know, tournament friendly characters. What characters are hot at the moment? You know, when you discover new tech for them, do they yeah, move in the meta always, and all that sort of changing. stuff? Balance patches are going to shift things around as well, and yeah, yeah. What well, what's your thought on that? Because like, like nobody balance patched chess, no. did they? Well, well chess actually, is a no. Game you can't. Because you're 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 no, playing no, with the no, identical. No, actually, I'm. Hold on, I'm going to go back okay. in time, and I'm gonna cut. I'm gonna start an argument with myself from a few seconds ago, which is well, that's not true. Because chess has been chess was a changing game for years and years. The original version of chess does not look like the mm. final version of chess, and there are permutations on chess. There is speed chess. There is like king's chess. There's different versions yeah. of that game there are different patches and different permutations for it somebody made a version of chess called chess 2 which is literally a sequel to chess which adds new characters it adds new um it like more places on the board and different pieces and stuff like that so no chess is a changing game yeah so no okay so i can kind of see it from 
But like in regards to like Smash Ultimate, like it keeps having patches and whatever, it's kind of an argument of when they change the meta of a character, is it because they want to make all characters kind of more that do they want every character to be to be on an S tier? Or do they kind of want to push the meta towards, say, this character needs to be more s ranky or oh they we need to nerf certain elements of it because that we're seeing this character too much in like um yeah you know community uh, fighting well, it's, it's kind of like yeah yeah uh for the most part well, okay most players would like argue that you want more buffs and nerfs because it's inherently less yeah. fun for a character that's for someone who plays a character for that character to then get nerfed and then not enjoy playing them anymore Whereas if oh, you sure. enjoy a character and then they buff that character, that's just yeah, that's great, that's fun, and you want. Well, but then if you're on the other side of oh, this character's been buffed, which now nerfs my character because I can't break out of their particular attack. Sure, but like since there's over seventy characters, you're you're gonna be. It's impossible that yeah, you couldn't. There's guarantee so many matchups, absolutely. Like, uh, things that you have to. You're it, not every character can play every character very well. No, of course. There are some That's, at the I mean, top, that is... but like, yeah, they don't have much problem in any matchup, but... No, which is why yeah. they're at the top, because they're quite... Yeah. Um, But, yeah, no, for the most part, they've done pretty... They've done better than they did with Smash 4. Yeah, I remember the Smash 4 kind of had, like... There were ba- barely any... Like, Diddy Kong never left the top he, rank, he did, did he? He Well, he was number one, undoubtedly, at first, but he, he was yeah. stayed around top 5, 10, even when he was nerfed. And then... Yeah, because then they introduced the DLC characters yeah, Cloud, and that kind of Cloud changed the balance again. And Bayo, Bayo came hmm. out and she was... Yeah, I remember Bayo was always a number one. Well, I mean, there's the Evo, isn't it, where it's yeah. just two Bayo's fighting well, that, each other, that was right? the thing. They, they nerfed her twice after she was released. And it, neither was enough. 100% not enough. Um, But that hmm. was when they stopped developing the game. And they left oh, it. Sure. They just left her like that. And she... Which is interesting because it's kind of like, like, did they leave chess? Like, could that be better improved upon, or is it perfect as it is? Well, at least you don't have to worry. Like, I, I don't think there's any dominant strategy. That, that is when something needs nerfing. If it's too dominant, like you can have characters that are better than others, but when that character is just so much better than any other character, and there's no point in picking those other characters, that's when you have a problem. No, exactly. Which is in you know, and that's where the that's where the yeah, argument Brawl, lies. Brawl had that there. problem as well with Meta Knight, um, which is why he was yeah, highly he... scuffed to banning mm. him. Uh, whereas mm. Bayo never got banned. No, which is interesting. It's, it's no, hard it's to ban kind of... a fighting game character. It's just there's too many steps to go to. Uh, yeah, exactly, and like not every community probably follows yeah. the same rules and you know all it's, that sort of stuff. Tough. And plus, the moment that you find new tech, then you unban the character, mm. don't you? Yeah. And- Which, yeah, it's it's like, the really it's an interesting conversation in it. And again, and it kind of even falls under the not to you know put on my Jim Sterling hat or anything, but you could even have the thing of like, do you buff a character because they're a new DLC character or they got a new game coming out or something like that? Which I know they've never done in no. Smash. Because it would upset the mayor, but it's kind of like you know that's that's a potential idea, isn't it? Or you could change the nerfing of another character because oh that character is no longer has a series or whatever, you know. So uh, it's interesting. Again, I mean, how you know how do you solve a problem like making all seventy characters feel completely balanced? They've done a good another? job of it. But I think the problem is is that I don't. No, I, I think, think they have. There are I... probably zero characters that okay, maybe other than Little Mac. Uh... <laughs> That just can't. Do you know what the thing is? Is place in the meta. you know what as well? I think if it was perfect out of the gate, I think there would be a drop off with it. I think the arms race of finding new tech and finding new ways to get your character to number one. I think yeah. that's what keeps Whereas the community fire melee going. Melee is well. I mean, the, the, for for the most part, like it has had shakeups, but at this point in time, that game is pretty stagnant with which characters are viable and which the, aren't. I mean, it's like Street Fighter 2. There's there's nothing else that can be mined. I mean, that game has been in play for now over two decades. Well, yeah. There is nothing more that can be found with it, you know? Yeah. 
I like people are still finding stuff in 10, 10 years in, but I think at this point it's yeah, you want that that tier list is maybe shake up the top the top two or three, but the rest is is not going to change. And I would say that I find that less interesting than yeah. Ultimate, which is this new fresh thing where it is still yeah, changing. New you know, being added and yeah, it's yeah. it's always interesting. Awesome. It's it's. It's like the conversation that we had about mysteries, where do you leave it at, do you have it being changing, or do you have it being static? You know, what is the right answer for it? And, yeah. Well, Ben, thank you for educating me on the Smash educating community and making tier lists. What would... <laughs> yes, technically educating Wales. Right. We have got one final I'm going to try and make this one thing. work. Okay, that's fine. What is this category again? Uh, so this is our most... I know. <laughs> this is our most contentious category, with an even more contentious name, which is Sprouts and Bacon. Ben, what's your opinion on Sprouts at Christmas? Uh, I don't like Sprouts at all. But this is the thing. So Sprouts are things that people don't usually like at Christmas. Well, no one, kind of no one of family, family try- likes them, so we don't bother. Oh, wow. That's See, because this is the thing. My family does, and we do Sprouts and Bacon. I don't know if you know this, but putting bacon with sprouts, it improves them. It makes something that you wouldn't usually like, you like. But then here's the thing. Sometimes you have sprouts without bacon, and then you go, actually, these are pretty good. I This was something that I used to hate, or I think I didn't like, but I actually do like it. Or it's something that I like, but other people, much like yourself, don't like. Yeah. And these picks are games like that. These are games that either we thought we were going to hate, but ended up really liking, or the games that we love, but for some reason they haven't gelled with the mainstream audiences of the world at large. I know what your pick yep. is, Ben, but you might as well tell the okay. audience at home. What so, is it? Forza Horizon 4. Forza Which Horizon 4, the driving didn't come game. Out this year. Uh, it released on, well, PC Game Pass released this year. So yes. it was my first chance to play it. And yeah, uh, it's very good. <laughs> Uh, going hmm. in, I kind of, I mean, I thought I might enjoy it for a little bit because it's a, uh, in Britain and that was literally the only selling point I had. It's like a car game in Britain. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and I played it and I loved it and I made a video about it, which you can watch on my channel. And I don't have hmm. too much more to say about it other than just, it's very good, solid, fun. Well, let's step okay. back a little bit. The the fact that it is your Brussels sprout pick. So... Before Forza Horizon 4, what was your relationship with racing games? Uh, I enjoy Mario Kart, and I enjoy Burnout mm-hmm. 3. <laughs> so, say, Gran Turismo, not your bag. I... I... The, original, the original Forza Motorsport, not your no, bag. I didn't appeal. Like, I'd, I'd, when I was but... a kid, I played a lot of racing games. Just I just had some, and I played them. I played Need for Speed Underground 2, which I did really enjoy, but I didn't like the racing. <laughs> I just kind of, I liked no. the fact there was an open world and I could go around and decorate my car. Sure. Uh, whereas um, another one I played, I don't even remember, I, I can't remember what it was, but it was a, a like a pretty standard racing game. You just race in it, and I didn't think it was... Was it like a rally maybe, game or like a Colin McRae? I'm not or sure, so? it was on the original Xbox, and I did not like it very okay. much. Oh, uh, like uh, Project Gotham? Maybe. Um, I, yeah, I genuinely know okay. what it was, but I did not enjoy All it right. very much. Uh, no, that's fine. Burnout 1, I also had, didn't enjoy that very much. Uh, hmm. And yeah, it was really just Burnout 3. What do you... Uh, yeah. What do you think it is about them that put you off them? I just... There was, like... I guess it was the controls I didn't think were that interesting. Whereas, like... And okay. there just wasn't enough there well, to keep me interested whereas with a mario kart it's very colorful and fun and there's items and yeah the appeal of mario kart is that it has translated the appeal of super mario brothers but into a racing format where it is the they are tracks but they are essentially obstacle courses yeah. where you do have to avoid stuff you can pick up power-ups which make it easier but also you have eight other people to worry about and so it is kind of like it's fun in that aspect, and again, like you're going through these different worlds. The driving is tuned in such a way that it feels like you're driving Mario, not like you're driving a car. Yeah, and really. and the reason it has oh, its yeah. own. Which 
obviously a game like Project Gotham or a game like Need for Speed, they're trying to emulate the feel and the aesthetic of real driving, essentially. Like that's the people who have who enjoy those games, that's where they get their appeal is I'm never gonna own a Ferrari, but I can drive one around, you know, Santa Monica in this game. Or, you know, I I drive a Ford GT in real life, but I want to drive it around the the big ring, you know? Yeah. We're- well, at least I kind of think that's the appeal in that, or it's just kind of the appeal of sort of car culture stuff, like people who watch Top Gear and whatever. I, which and I, you're not into that. I'm not really into that. But I enjoyed. Go on. Oh yeah, another thing. I it kind of reminded me of how I would watch Top Gear when I was younger, but I I hated the car okay. showcases. I found them boring as hell. I I think that's. My, I just yeah. felt like I was sitting through that part of them, and I wanted them to do silly stuff in the cars and traveling across countries and. I think that's the reason that Top Gear boats. became the when Cl- when Clarkson took it over proper and turned it more into a variety show with cars. I think that's when it yeah. blew up. Was not when they were talking about the new Audi you know, R8 Ford GT, but instead they were you know building a car out of cardboard. Or they were doing a loop de loop yeah. or something like that, where it was using cars but applying it to a different thing, mm. essentially. Which I guess is the appeal of Horizon. Yeah. And, it, yeah, no, uh, Horizon is a variety game. It's got yes. loads of stuff to do. It's got random... It's It's got car stuff. It does. Hmm. But it also has collection. Uh, you can. It's got collectibles around the world. It's got little... It's Banjo-Kazooie, but the car, but the ban, but Banjo and Kazooie yeah. are a car. And it's got loads of and I even enjoy the races. Like I, yeah. I guess that's maybe the most surprising part about it. I, I think I might enjoy racing games now. I don't know. I'd have to maybe give another a shot. But I just. Well, this is the thing. Have you gone and tried any uh, any other no, racing games? But after I think this? maybe when that next Forza comes out and it comes on Game Pass, I'll give it a shot. Because I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of stuff that is like, I mean, Burnout Paradise is maybe the only thing I can think of which is like Forza Horizon, which you might. Like. Oh yeah, no, I I do want to play Paradise. Uh, because like Burnout okay. obviously has that uh, appeal of it was yeah, more arcadey. I just yeah. enjoy destroying cars in it. That was why I played it with my Absolutely. friends. Absolutely. Uh, we just it was fun. It was exciting. I liked Absolutely. the uh, little challenges you had to do where you had to destroy cars in certain ways and get little achievements mm. that way. No, sure. Yeah, no. Again, it turns cars into a variety show, mm. which is kind of the more appealing thing about it. it is applying... Because, again, like Forza Horizon doesn't dumb anything down. It's got all the tuning stuff and all the bonkers nonsense of the Forza Motorsport games, which, I, I mean, I will say, I, I'm very similar to you. I was started playing Horizon after you did, and I found myself getting really into tuning the cars, mm. which I wouldn't have... In, any other aspects but the reason is because tuning the cars did have an actual effect like i got better race lines or i could do jumps better or like you know i could just put more power into an engine and just like see how that felt and it was neat yeah. fiddling around it's, with that it's stuff. more gamey but... than most racing games it feels yeah. like it's made for the person who plays video games rather than the person who likes cars like, I can understand why uh, the Xbox One S, whenever you sometimes see deals of them in, like, shops, they sell it with uh, the Forza Horizon 3 with the Hot Wheels pack. I think that's, like, the best approach to get somebody into that game is kind of, hey, we got this realistic driving sim, but we have fun with yeah. it, essentially. So, okay, so your so your argument to the people at home is, hey, if you're not into driving games, maybe give Horizon also a try. Also give my video because... a try. Yeah, Ben's video on Horizon is good. I feel like it, it captures the energy of the game I like to quite well. So. The... Yeah, I would say <laughs> so. Uh, ben, what do you think my choice was for uh, <laughs> Sprouts and Pagan? Uh, oh, I mean, yeah, no, I know. It's ukulele. Uh, nuts and bolts. Uh, ukulele and the first for by uh, Play Sonic Games. I don't really want to go into it too much because, again, we had we I went into it pretty detailed yeah. in the uh, in a previous episode of Game of Time. So all I'll go into is kind of the surrounding of it, which is again, 
I'm not. I didn't like the original ukulele. I I know that game has its fans. And I know that game has its proponents. But I, the problem is the problem isn't that I didn't like ukulele. I think I don't like that entire genre anymore, which I know is sacrilegious to mm. say. I am somebody in my late twenties who did have an N sixty four growing up. I did play Banjo Kazooie. I did play Banjo Tooie. I played, played Donkey Kong sixty four. I, I would say that at one point in my life they were, quote unquote, my favorite games to play. And yet now I go back to them and I genuinely do not enjoy playing them anymore. Ben, you don't really. I, I'm like, have you played any of these very kind of games? Wax, I guess. I don't. They're. they're ju- well, I mean, I just you, kind well, of that's, well, that's the thing. And... What's what's your what, what's your history with them? Uh, I didn't play a lot of them when I was younger. Uh, other than Galaxy. No, well, I mean, this is... Like, Galaxy was my 3D Mario. And the thing is, is that I remember at the time people didn't like Mario Galaxy because they felt that it was a step back from Sunshine because it was linear levels again. It was an open yeah. world where I think a lot of people have in their heads, and I still think that this is the case, that open world is like... The, the like that's what all games are like moving towards like that is the best a game could be is a completely open world sandbox experience but i i do prefer the, free, the more focused 3d titles like galaxy and this is 3D the thing world. super mario the super mario galaxy games all of them are better than super mario sunshine and super mario 64 and odyssey odyssey is a weird one i want to go back and i want to replay it i wanted to put some time between the first time i played it and the second time i played it and now this will be the third time i'll play through it again because i want to go into it with a fresh head but i feel that the reason i liked odyssey so much is that it is really linear Hmm. in most of its mission design stuff it, in fact, you could argue that it wastes its open world because of it. Mm. Yet, I like the structure of that game quite a bit. But that's mostly from the second playthrough and the first playthrough I did. I might play it again, I might not like it, we'll never know. That being said, I've played Mario Galaxy 1 and Mario Galaxy 2 maybe eight or nine times. And like, I still really enjoy those games quite a bit. They're very good. This is 3D Land and 3D World, which are I okay. I like 3D World a lot. But... I don't like it as much as the Galaxies, but I do really like it. But this is the thing. I feel like the Galaxy games get it right in regards to... They feel more open than the f- yeah. than 3D they World feel does. They more like worlds than 3D World, which is like, yeah. I, but this it kind of yeah, wasn't it's what the weird 3D thing World is... was going for, but it is nice to have. I drew it. I almost made a video about this because I have all the diagrams on my computer where I drew the structure of a free of a Mario Galaxy level, which is it's like beads on a line where each bead is those little planetoids, and those planetoids feel like a really small version of like a Super Mario sixty four level, mm-hmm. where you're always moving through it linearly, but the objectives of these little planetoids are always kind of open. Yeah. Like like collecting the blue star stuff or like collecting the pieces of the launch stars. Yeah. That feels like, you know, collecting red coins or silver stars in Mario 64 DS, but on little planetoids. And then you might get to a planetoid which is a bit more linear, or you might get to another puzzle one, or you might get to like a combat challenge. Each one feels like a little different thing, but you're still moving through them bit by bit, linear, linear, which I think is the best way that of, I think that is like the best Mario structure, which is why I like bits of odyssey because it feels like that but they just made the planetoid so big that they oversect over one another and it's a big flat world um banjo kazooie hasn't got that neither does banjo 2 neither does donkey Kong 64 they have got really really awful objective design like and again i know this is going to ruffle, ruffle, ruffle feathers of people who might be listening to this but those games have aged really awfully donkey Kong 64 and banjo 2 especially have the issue of they're too big, and by being too big, everything feels really um, padded maybe, and maybe really stretched out and all over banjo. them. I don't know. Maybe it'll What's ruffle that? my feathers when I play through banjo. I think I think because you've never played these games before, I think banjo kazooie hasn't got this problem so much because it's their first game and they make it smaller because of it. Donkey Kong sixty four and banjo too, just by their very banjo, design, uh, they're, banjo, they're bigger. Uh, DK sixty four is just. Ugh. 
Yeah, DK64 is like... It's a, the problem with DK64 is, and I always use this example for everything, which is each Donkey Kong 64 objective is exactly the same, which is you push a button and you get a banana. The problem is, is that sometimes you press the button and they say, no, you need to be a different monkey to push the button. And you go, okay. And then you go and push the button and they say, no, actually, you need a different ability to do it. Or you need a different instrument. Or you need to... Essentially, it's just like little gates between every single thing. And the thing is, is that they change what the button looks like. Maybe the button is a... Like it's a pad that you stand on. Or maybe it's a door that you need to lock. Or whatever. Like they use context to change it up. But mechanically, it always boils down to exactly the same thing. Which is just pushing buttons. And it sucks. And sometimes you push a button and you get a mini game. And again, mini games are alright. But it doesn't do enough to kind of break up what the essentially what it is which is they're like boiled down zelda games where you don't unlock keys to get more parts of the dungeon the entire dungeon's just already unlocked for you it's just pushing buttons and it sucks and that was the problem with the original <laughs> yeah. ukulele because people said i want this and they and did now it. you're saying all this to build into talking about a 2d game yes uh, so with ukulele and the impossible air, I think we could, and so we were talking about Kickstarter earlier, and we were saying about how Kickstarter has been this kind of, this nice thing for people who can finally get games that they wanted, that they've missed. But I think the problem with Kickstarter is, and I'm not saying this with everything, I haven't played Bloodstained, so I don't know. I haven't played, what was the game that you mentioned that was a Kickstarter game? I haven't played Mighty Number no. 9, even though I know it's bad. Broken Age, though, was probably the first big Kickstarter success. And it is a classic point-and-click adventure game in the style of LucasArts games. And I played that, and I didn't like it. And I played the other one, um, Fimbleweed Park, and I didn't like that either. That has exact. And the problem is, is that they don't make concessions for people who didn't grow up on those games. Basically, you're buying into this because you're already drinking whatever they're making. Like, again, that's why they got funded, because people want games that feel like this. No no frills or spills or whatever. They want this exact experience. And there was a game that I played earlier this year, well, not earlier this year, late in this year, both of us played this, that I had exactly the same issue, even though it wasn't a Kickstarter game. And that was Outer Worlds where that is a game made for people who love um, Fallout New Vegas. I don't <laughs> like Fallout New Vegas, and so and I, I started play playing Fallout that New game. Vegas, and... and I did not like Outer Worlds either. No, I genuinely did not get on with that game at all. And yet, I started playing a Disco Elysium, which is like uh, Baldur's Gate, and I don't have too much of a bad time with that game, because it's more about story-driven stuff, which I don't think I've seen in any game like that. And so we get to the ukulele, finally. Finally, ukulele in the impossible layer, where basically Team 17 have gone to them and they've said, all right, we're not going to pay you to do another full 3D ukulele game, but we have got enough money here that maybe, say, you can take the assets you've already built and make something smaller. And so they look into their back history and they say, well, we were good at making Donkey Kong Country style games. And those are popular enough, you know, the Donkey Kong Country series has come out on, you know, Tropical Freeze came out on Switch. The one on the Wii did very well as well, the 3DS as well. Why don't we try and do something like that? But they're not really have a target audience in mind for this. They're just trying something out. And, you know, the overworld stuff, nobody nobody was like, you know, punching their fists saying, we want an open world that does this and this. This is just something that they tried. And even though it's not original, because it is like Donkey Kong Country, and it's like Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, it feels really fresh, but it's also really, really good. Like, and I'm not saying this because, oh, Donkey Kong Country stuff, that just, you know, works across the board. Because again, I'm not the biggest fan of Tropical Freeze. And going back to some of the older, well, actually, I, I go back to Donkey Kong Country 1 and 2, and I had never played these games when they came out, but I played them, like, about 10 years ago, and I've played them since, and they still hang, they still hold up. But, like, if somebody went on to Kickstarter and said, I want to make a game exactly like these, it'd be like, okay, but we've got more buttons on a controller now, so why don't you give us some, like, extra moves, or why don't you make stuff a bit simpler, or whatever. And Ukulele in the Possible Lair does have those concessions, which I do like. 
but it is the the tweaks to the formula that they've added which i like it's the change in the levels through the overworld it's you know um how you move through levels and kind of the you know the different tonics and stuff like that it's it's taken something that essentially the problem with the first time they did it was they were too faithful to something which needed to be updated and then they did something which was based on some original but they weren't faithful to it at all they tried something different and they benefited from it which i think is kind of my main thing with all, i mean i'm the only person on youtube who likes banjo kazooie nuts and bolts for that very reason because they did something different and they reaped the benefits of it but so that's why it's my it's <laughs> my it's my it's and and you fake you say because... more about it in the last you go into more detail and the, the actual game itself rather than the background this is the thing. I didn't want to repeat what I yeah. said in the last episode of Game Over Time because I am more detailed. That I wanted to make a case for why it was my yeah. sprouts and bacon. And I feel like in order to do so, I had to talk about the context around it. Which yeah. I feel like yeah, I did, I did a good job. pretty well. Nice. Cool. Ah, have we got any more honorable mentions, though, before we... Uh... Uh... I would like to say the entire Microsoft Game Pass experience. That's my honorable yeah, no, mention. That's a good one. Because... Oh boy, that that Microsoft Game Pass it is again. I will concede. I will say to people at home, "Hi, people at home. It's me again." Talking to you directly again. Making games are expensive. Making games are hard. And the people who put a lot of time and a lot of effort into making sure that people play their games, I do feel for them. It's not easy. I mean, we, me and Ben, we make have to make games on Game Overtime all the time. But unfortunately, well, fortunately, I guess we don't then go to the process of having to program them and write for them or whatever. And, you know, uh, the people who make games should be properly compensated for what they do. Which, you look at a system like Microsoft Game Pass, where it is so cheap to play a catalogue of games every month, you go, well, you know, they can't be being properly compensated for it. I can only imagine that the deals that they yeah. sign with Microsoft are enough that they do cover stuff. But then, at the same time, I look at it and I go, something like Sea of Thieves, if that had come out re just retail, I don't think it would have lived past, you know, the first few months. And yet, through Game Pass and through the constant monthly up-subbing and stuff like that, that is a game that can continue yeah. to live on. And since then, has got better because of that. They've been able to change it and adapt it and tweak it as time has gone on, it's which is fantastic. Cool. And I think with, like, B-tier, well, not B-tier, but, like, Smaller games, maybe single A tier games, maybe even like episodic games like Life is Strange and stuff. That's the stuff that's going to live on this new format, which I think is really good. I think, especially if you're somebody who can't play a lot of games or doesn't have a lot of money for games every month, if you don't mind playing older stuff or like exclusive Microsoft stuff. It's not stuff, even older stuff. It, like they, they get new stuff on there a lot. And the catalog they is do. massive. It is humongous. I mean, if you have an Xbox One, it's even better because you can play like 360 games on it. You get, I think there's some original Xbox stuff it, on there as well. Nuts. It is nuts. It's cheap. It's nuts. You get free ones. I, I think I saw, oh, what was it? I took a picture of it. It was a, uh, we, we went into an American uh, candy store and, oh yeah, they had Pop-Tarts with free Microsoft Game Pass things on them. Uh, there was a time when like Pizza Hut were doing like, you get it. It basically it became the now TV of yeah. like game stuff where they just gave it away with everything. And it's, it, I genuinely think, and I think this is this is this is a pie in the sky. This is a moonshot, and I don't think it's going to come true. But I think if they can come into the next generation with Game Pass right, like on the box, right out of the gate, I think I think they could. I think they might they might win it. Because Sony hasn't got I, anything like this. Oh, I don't. I mean, think Sony doesn't so, need it. A hundred percent honest. But okay. You, well, I mean, you, I mean, I guess it's kind of it's more believing in the classic model of you buy the console which has all the best exclusives, all the games that you want. Yeah, in like, it. I, which the PS4 that was that the console, console this itself generation. Is like, since it works on PC, I just, you know, I, yeah. That's the thing in it, is that if I can get it on PC, why would I bother buying a yeah. dedicated console for it? I mean, it's a win-win for Microsoft yeah, I'm, I'm, anyways. I'm very cool but... with it. I, I, I like the fact that they're getting their games on PC with Master Chief Collection being the big new one. 
But I do wonder whether the way that they could sell it is like, look, you could get this on PC, but we can just bill you a dedicated piece of machinery for this amount of money, and it just runs all these Game Pass games right out of the box. Like buying, like, it's like buying a set top box for a um, you know, for like Freeview or like for now TV yeah. in it. I mean, you can run that on a PC, but you know, eh, I don't. Well, okay. Well, I mean, like I said, there's pie in the sky. It might not happen. We'll see what happens. So I'll leave it there. But yeah, there we go, everybody. That was our uh, 2019 hot, hot, uh, hot, hot chocolate break segment. Um, I did have some more lists, but what I'm thinking is, is hey, why don't we spin that off into maybe its own little episode <laughs> and see where we go from there? But yeah, we'll we'll head back into uh, the. Yeah, let's get back to Santa's game. So, about that... Oh, oh, I just got a text from Santa. Oh, what does it say? Actually, it came in through like... It came in like an hour ago. Oh, oh God. How long will we on uh, ch- chocolate break for? I don't know. Um, What's it say? Uh, uh, No no need to bother with the game anymore, boys. I've just discovered Fortnite, and I think this will keep me occupied for the rest of all time. Oh. Oh. Ben, did oh. we spend so long on hot chocolate break that we didn't actually finish making a game this week? It, it does look like that, yeah. Oh, God. I mean, to be fair, they're going to keep updating Fortnite until we all die. Oh, yeah, so. no, I'm still, yeah, no, if you, need a, if you need a game to play, then yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I hope it doesn't affect his, you know, his giving his presence or anything if he's too busy playing Fortnite. I hope, like, it yeah. does mean that rather than, like, giving people, like, actual presents, he just gives them V-Bucks and stuff. Oh, that would be all. Oh, actually, no, I think the kids would like that. Yeah. Well. Well, Ben, I, it's pitch black outside. Um, I feel like we've been here for hours. I think we should Days. just get... Let's just close for Christmas and try this again next year. Uh, we've been... We've been done out. We, we've been outdone by Epic Games again. Again. Yeah. Hopefully for the last time. Hopefully. Well... Well, why didn't you say... That sa- thing I always say at the end of one of these. <sighs> Omne opus non ludere. Uh, which, of course, is Latin for When the snowman sees the snow When the snowman sees the snow When the snowman sees the snow